Good afternoon, all. Um, welcome to October 27th, uh, 2020 uh, teleconference meeting of the Board of Education, a regular meeting. In compliance with Governor Newsom's executive order N-29-20, in, respo in response to ongoing COVID outbreak, the board um, district will conduct the Board of Education meetings as a teleconference. Given the health risks associated with COVID-19, the Newport Mesa Unified School District has decided not to open the boardroom to the public. Habrá interpretación al español a través del mismo enlace de Zoom. So I'm calling to order the October 27th, 2020 board meeting uh, to order. Uh, roll call, Rosie. Trustee Floor. Present. Trustee Yelsey. Here. Trustee Black. Here. Trustee Bartow. Here. Trustee Anderson. Here. Trustee Snell. I know she's here. Here. Anyway. Trustee Matoye. Here. Mr. Lee Sung. Here. Terrific. Uh, we have uh, several com items on community input on closed agenda items. So, uh, Trustee Black, would you read the uh, community input, please? Sure. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the closed session agenda via electronically submitted comments. Each speaker has three minutes of comment read, read time and per board policy 9323, there is a maximum of 20 minutes of comments per topic. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments depending on the topic and the number of persons submitting comments. All comments are recorded in full on the meeting video record. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, currently we have 91 comments that were received in total. Uh, the breakdown is as follows, and I will, again, I will repeat this in open session as well when we go come back from close. We have item on item 4A, closed session, threat to public services or facilities. We have two comments. On item 15A, report COVID-19 update, we have five comments. On 16A, discussion action approved start date and instructional model for reopening, we have 63 comments. On item 16C, discussion action approved name change and grade span of Monte Vista High School, we have two comments. On 16D, discussion action approve agreement with Addiction Treatment Technologies, LLC, DBA Care Solace, one comment. Item 17, which is the consent calendar, we have 13 comments on items 17A2, ratify agreement with MTGL for GeoPair Foundation Design Theater Project at Estancia High School, we have 10. 17A8, approve com, uh, agreement with CEM Lab for sports field at Corona Del Mar High School, we have one. 17 CA approved MOU between NMUSD and NMFT re first trimester elementary uh, report card period. We have one and 17 C 24 approved certificated employment um, contract uh, employment assignment alternative options. Uh, we have one. So with that, we will go to uh, community comments on uh, the closed session, which is to Trustee Anderson. Yes, um, my comment is from an employee. Please ensure all Thank secondary you. sites have full safety measures in place, including plexiglass. There still are areas on elementary sites that have no plexiglass in their health office or their front office area. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Bartow? I have an anonymous 12th grader at CMHS. The school district is still not requiring teachers to temperature checking and screening students before entering their classrooms. Also, the student desks still do not have plastic protective shields on them. This is not safe at all. I commented last time because all I want is for these two things to be put into place in addition to all the other safety measures. Then I'll believe it's safe enough to, enough to go back to school. My mom is at risk for COVID and I want to make sure school is safe as possible so I don't potentially bring it home to her. Thank you. We will now uh, recess into closed session. We'll, we'll move into closed session. 
The items are 4A, threat to public services or facilities. Item 4B, conference with legal counsel. 4C, conference with labor negotiator and MUSD representative. 4D, public employee dismissal, discipline, dismissal, release, employment. And 4E, public employee discipline, release, and uh, dismissal, release, employment number 202008HR. There will be one readout from closed session on item 4E when we reconvene to the public webinar at 6 p.m. to begin the regular meeting. We will now log out and log back into our closed, se our closed session. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the uh, video conferencing of 277. Um, in compliance with Governor Newsom's executive order N2920 in response to the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak, the district will conduct the Board of Education's meeting as a teleconference. Given the health risks associated with COVID-19, the Newport Mesa a unified school district has decided not to open the boardroom to pu the public. Habrá uh, interpretación al español a través del mismo enlace de Zoom. Um, in closed session, I have a readout. Uh, in closed session, the Board of Education took action to approve the salary and reassignment agreement for number uh, number 20 hr the motion was moved by Trustee Black and seconded by Trustee Matoyer. It was a roll call vote and it was seven ayes and zero noes and no abstentions. Moving on, uh, we will move to uh, opening ceremonies. Please uh, stand for a silent uh, moment of reflection and Pledge of Allegiance led by Trustee uh, Matoye. Thank you. I'm gonna, if I mute myself, can you people hear? Can they? Can the public hear me if I mute? Yes. Okay. So it's, I'm just gonna. We're just. I'm on mute. Okay. So. We will move to uh, adoption of the agenda. We have a motion to move, uh, adopt the agenda, please. Move adoption move. of the agenda. I second. It was moved by Trustee Barto and seconded by Trustee uh, Matoye. Uh, roll call, please, Rosie. Trustee Floor. Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Trustee Black? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Snow? Yes. Trustee Snow? Um, I'm not, I'm not We have to make her a panelist. Sorry about that. Uh, please note that uh, Trustee Snell is in the witnesses and she is in the boardroom. Uh, so she, and she voted, she's uh, voted yes. Thank you. Trustee Matoya. Terrific, thank you. Um, adoption of the minutes of 10.06.20 and 10.08.20. Move approval as presented. Trustee Black moved. Is there a second? 
Trustee Yelsey seconded. So it's been moved by Trustee Black and seconded by Trustee uh, Yelsey to adopt the minutes of 06, 0, 010, 06, 20, and 010, 08, 20. Roll call, please. Trustee Floor. Yes. Trustee Yelsey. <laughs> Are you mute time? This is Yelsey. Trustee Yelsey. <clears throat> That's you, Karen. Can they hear you? It's supposed to be off when you vote. Yes. Yes. Trustee Black. Yes. yes. Trustee Bartel. Yes. Trustee Anderson. Yes. yes. Trustee Snell. Uh, she voted yes. And Trustee yes. Matoye. Trustee Matoye. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, we, yes. Okay, so we have a huge echo in here. Somebody has their speaker or something is on. And so it's really hard to hear. I'm all the way down. Somebody else? Ha okay, perfect. Much better. Thank you. Okay, so now we have uh, student board member reports as I want to remind the, the audience that we are very fortunate that we have eight um, absolutely outstanding individuals who are representing. Bailey Bogard is the chair uh, for the first semester. She's from Newport Harbor High School. She will be participating in all roll call votes except for those items that have to do with personnel. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bailey. I was under the impression it would go under alphabetical order for school for reporting. Um, I only have two other board members here, uh, student board members. So do you want, um, I can, I, that's fine. So we'll go with uh, Brittany from Estancia High School. Can you hear me? So, yes. my name is Brittany Brigetti, and I represent Estancia High School. I did a survey in which just under 140 high school students um, participated. When asked the question, how do you feel about returning back to Estancia in November, 39% um, were happy and excited, whereas 61% were unhappy, scared, or unsure. When asked the second question, do you feel the school and staff are prepared to receive students at Estancia High School on November 9th? percent of students or the thoughts of students at Estancia High School are that some Estancia High School students are optimistic, hopeful that the precautions taken by the district and um, the school will be enough, and they are excited to go to school and stop distance learning. Others argue that they they should wait until the semester ends to transfer to hybrid learning. Um, with concerns brought by the flu season. Those 61% of students um, brought to light their feelings of frustration and worry because of the continuous changes in their schedule and would like a clear answer. Those 61% also brought up the fact that their peers are not seeming to follow social distancing rules and COVID, and COVID precautions and for that reason are scared to come back and feel uncomfortable. Students also noted that Estancia is a majority Hispanic population, 70%, many living with extended family, which going back to school for them poses a risk to not, for not just the students, but their families, as the CDC states that in, inequities in social de detriments of health put racial and ethnic minorities at an increased risk of getting sick and dying from COVID-19. Overall, Estancia students have a mixed reaction from scared to excited to frustrated, the words waiting at the very least, the end of the semester for, new, for numerous concerns as previously explained. Although these were the results of the survey I conducted, I plead the district, regardless of the decision made today, to think about those who are without homes at this time and those with dangerous family situations who need our help more than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, Trustee uh, Snell. I did not hear the question. Are you on mute? 
unmute. Okay, now can you hear me? Brittany? No. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I am interested in knowing how many students you uh, surveyed. Uh, just under 150, 143 to be exact. Thank you very much. Terrific. And as a follow-up, you it was all, all grade levels? Yes, all grade levels were reached. I went through a variety of groups, tried to get everyone even through classes. I tried to get everyone as represented as possible. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll move to Paulina from Early College High School. Can you guys hear me? Okay, perfect. So hello everyone, my name is Paulina Enriquez and I am representing Early College High School. Students at Early College have a common concern. While we understand the reasons why the district would like us, to, like us students to return to school in person, we believe that it is too soon to go back to school. Especially now that we're nearing flu season and winter, we feel that returning to school next month is truly not the appropriate time to do so. We prefer to take our precautions. Uh, we also conducted our own, our, our own surveys and it is a 50-50 split of, in terms of preparation for distance learning, but the more, majority of us believe that, uh, like I said before, it's just not the appropriate time and it just messes up with our schedules uh, because we already have our schedules with our parents and our, the cohort split is going to mess up our mental health and the scheduling with our parents. Um, and the survey, because we're a smaller school, only like 76 people filled it out, and that uh, pertains to all freshmen, sophomore, and juniors and seniors. Thank you so much, Paulina. Really appreciate it. And now we'll go to our co-chair, uh, Bailey Bogard from Newport Harbor High School. Hello, everyone. I am Bailey Bogard, the student board representative for Newport Harbor High School. Um, unlike the other student board members here, a majority of Newport Harbor sailors do want to go back to school on November 9th. After many students have already been on campus to see the new changes um, that have been put into place, most students said that um, they feel our school and our school district is taking social distancing and other COVID measures, measures very seriously. Also, given the new hybrid plan and the addition of hybrid group C, a group of students that would not return to school yet remain a Newport Harbor sailor by taking classes in their homes, many students feel it is safe to return back to school. This third option has eased the minds of around 20% of Newport Harbor students as they would opt in to this third hybrid group. The other 80% of Newport Harbor students are asking that the school board votes to bring us back on November 9th. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, all three of you. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, Bailey will be voting on this um, and Bailey will have a conversation because I know uh, you had a conversation with Trustee Yelsey in regards to the results of some polling that you did be amongst your, your colleagues. And so uh, we'll let you express that um, at the time of the vote, okay? Uh, terrific. And we will now go to the Harbor Council PTA president. Um, that would be uh, Lisa Bowler. Good evening, um, everyone. Thanks for having us again. I don't have a whole lot to report because unfortunately, there's not a whole lot that PTAs can be doing at this time. But um, we are moving forward. We're getting our year, year end audits, which is the time period from January 1st through June 30th. We're getting our audits prepared. Once those are done, then it's time for us to get our taxes done. As a nonprofit, we have to have our taxes done before November 15th, which is four months and 15 past the end of our fiscal period, which ends on June 30th. So we're in the process of getting the taxes done. We're helping the PTAs that um, don't have someone on their campus who can help or helping them find a um, professional who will um, be able to do the taxes. They're very involved now and we can't risk, um, like I can do our schools that are under 50,000, but the ones that make over that, they really need to have a professional do their taxes because if a mistake is made, it can be very um, costly and 
Not a good thing. So we're working on that. And um, good news is our membership is up to over 3,100. So thank you to everybody out there who has joined the PTA. Remember, <clears throat> you don't have to have a child at the school to show your support for that school. And if you go to jointotem.com, um, most all of our schools are on except for, I believe, five. And um, you can just, with a click of the button, go straight to that school and, and um, find out exactly how to join, very simple. Um, also, our Reflections program, which is a national PTA art and um, reading, they have poetry, they have photography, they have dance, music, um, visual arts. That has um, been taken place. We have 14 of our schools participating and we have received 58 entries so far. Uh, because of COVID, we will be um, not being able to have our normal reflections gallery. So we are going through the process of how best to do it and we will be doing it we just don't know when but it will be virtual and once that is um, available we'll let you all know and hopefully um, everybody will be able to participate so anyway that's my report thank you very much thank you so much uh, lisa we really appreciate all the hard work that the ptas are doing um, and really adjusting many of the PTAs and PFOs are handling their meetings on, on Zoom. And so we really appreciate and thank you also for the forum that you presented at the beginning of October. We really appreciate, oh, thank um, you. appreciate that for all, all, the, you. all the candidates. Moving on, we are going to uh, move to uh, Pam Saunders, our association president for CSEA. Uh, to make three com three minutes of comments on highlighting their association's uh, activities. Pam. Good evening, President Fleur Board, Superintendent Lee Sung, Cabinet and guests. First, thank you for this opportunity from CSEA. First and foremost, we'd like to thank all our classified employees throughout our district. We are very grateful to every classified employee for doing their part and all their hard work. Tonight, our hearts are heavy and our thoughts are with our students and staff impacted by the devastating fires. We wish for a speedy recovery to those that have been impacted. Um, CSEA does have two things coming up. Uh, we have a paraeducator conference in March and we do have an MNO Academy coming up, um, not this weekend, but next weekend. So our employees can sign up for those, but they are Zoom. Uh, we are thankful that the district has taken the time to listen to us regarding the reopening of the schools for in-person instruction and the effects involved for our members and guaranteeing that our employees' safety is the number one priority during these uncertain times. At this time, we are still very concerned about safety at our schools and work sites. And with the return of secondary students, we have even more worries. Some of these concerns include, our members are being tasked to enforce social distancing, which is nearly impossible to do with large groups of students to remain masked while at lunch and other break periods, especially since we haven't received site plans. Cleaning supplies have been provided without proper training. While we understand the hiring process is timely, the custodial staff that was promised to be hired is still not working at school sites. We are no longer being included in the, in the development of reopening plans, whereas being before our input, was being taken into consideration. We were promised that we wouldn't start in-person learning until it was safe to do so, and that all of the staff precautions were in place for students and staff, and unfortunately, that is not the case. We presented our, issue, our issues to the district leadership, and some of our concerns and requests are still outstanding. We are very disappointed as it appears you are not supporting classified employees and the students we serve. We have been working in these hazardous conditions since the beginning of the pandemic. Classified employees want to continue to support our students and have them on campus for in-person learning, but we want to ensure it is done in a safe manner. Again, thank you again for this opportunity, CSEA Chapter 18. Thank you. 
Thank you, Pam. And please relay to, on behalf of the board, all the hard work that I know all of your classified members are, are participating in. We really appreciate all, everything that they are doing. Uh, moving you. on to our Federation President, uh, Tamara Fairbanks for Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers. Good evening, board, honored guests. Um, this weekend is daylight savings time. And when we think about daylight savings time, we think about falling back and springing forward. For me, I think about refreshing batteries in our smoke detect detectors. And I bring this up because much of our staff needs this. They need to refresh their batteries. They have spent the spring, the summer, and the fall being the Energizer Bunny. They went to staff developments, figured out ways to pare down their curriculum, took care of their families and devised ways to make sure that their families didn't get sick during in-person learning. As they did this, expectation upon expectation has fallen upon them to the point of forgetting about the pandemic. As some of my colleagues experienced the ash going through the classrooms, we all are reminded of the humanity and struggle this pandemic has placed on this workforce. Our colleagues teach and work in spite of these struggles. Even as some evacuate from their homes, they're still thinking about their classroom and their classroom expectations. We're asking you trustees to help our workforce to acknowledge their humanity, to fix what is broken and to acknowledge that they can give what they can give. Some of these colleagues not only endured teaching in classrooms that were sanitized for three weeks and with math programs that just now getting the supplies, all while juggling family issues and health. These colleagues are now trying to protect themselves and families from breathing in smoke in addition to an airborne pathogen. Acknowledging their work, not just in, on words, but in public record. Acknowledging the countless hours they spend in person and in distance learning. Acknowledging them with time to actually go to the bathroom in a way to feel safe. And just showing our employees an action that will foster just confidence in everything that they do. And so let's, let's stop supplying our workforce with used batteries. Let's make them new. Let's make them feel confident. Let's make them feel safe. Thank you, Thank you Tamara. And the same thing goes for your employees as well and your members. Um, we are very grateful to everyone that is working very hard. Uh, we're all under some, so much stress and we appreciate the teachers having to step forward and actually um, be on, so to speak, in spite of all of the things that they're dealing with their personal lives. And so we really do appreciate all their very hard work and their commitment to our students um, and their communities. Uh, moving on, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Charlene Ashendorf. She is a longtime member of of our community of Costa Mesa and as well as our Arts Commission. Um, I asked her, she asked if she could make a presentation because she's just been recently appointed to the Arts Alliance. And so I have asked her to do an informational. So Charlene. This is a board who supports the arts and our students are better because of it. Good evening, President Floor, trustees, Superintendent Lee Sung and members of the community. My name is Charlene Ashendorf, and I am addressing you this evening as the president uh, suggested. I am the advocate with the California Alliance for the Arts Education appointed to represent our district. And I know you're juggling all kinds of monumental issues right now, and I appreciate you allowing me to speak a few moments and uh, to, to watch a video that will follow that's been created and presented by Create California. Tonight I ask that the board, uh, begin, as you begin your planning in the future for setting goals for the new academic year, that you do so with arts in your hearts. Arts are essential to all of us. Now more than ever, arts matter. Uh, thank you, and you will be hearing more from me month after month as information comes down through uh, Sacramento, through California Coalition. And so with that, that concludes my preliminary comments, and um, I ask that uh, uh, staff push that video button. Did you know California's education code mandates all schools offer classes in dance, music, theater, and visual art? 
These classes are core curriculum with updated standards and frameworks, but only 12% of our schools have been meeting that mandate. Why is this important? Research shows the arts impact every measure on the accountability dashboard. Students with an arts education are five times more likely to stay in school, three times more likely to get a bachelor's degree, and four times more likely to be recognized for academic achievement. Students are not getting what they need and deserve. Those who are low income and of color face the greatest barriers to a full and relevant arts education. This is an equity issue. Of all core curriculum, the arts are unique in their ability to lower anxiety, engage your students, and achieve district goals in all other subjects, including English as a second language. Arts education matters outside the classroom too. In 2019, California's creative economy generated 2.7 million jobs, and creativity is the skill most sought after by employers. As we rebuild our state's economy, we need innovative students ready and able to fill the jobs of the future. Beyond academics and the economy, this moment requires that students' mental health and well-being be at the forefront of our decisions. Studies show arts education helps students heal from trauma and build resilience. The socio-emotional benefits are clear. It's not just nice to have. It's not optional. It's essential. If your district doesn't have an arts plan or needs help implementing one, Create California is here to help. Let's make every student a creative student. Thank you, Charlene. It is truly important that we do honor the arts. Um, as I finish my term of office um, with the board, I can honestly say that this entire board um, and the district offices are committed to the arts. I hope to see them expanded. I will join you on the other side of the dais as we promote this um, because I believe that we should be expanding dance and visual arts into our lower elementary and to our elementary schools. We have a great program all the way through with, with our music education, but I hope to see some additional ones and not rely on outside sources to provide that. And we're very fortunate that our superintendent currently is a, an arts educator, a music educator, well, well, well versed in that. And so again, thank you so much for presenting that. I really appreciate it and keep up the good work and I'll see you on the other side of the dais. I look forward to that. Thank you, President Floor. Thank you. Okay, okay. moving on to uh, community input. I just would like to give some information regarding community input. Uh, we received a total of 91 comments um, that included duplicates. Um, we had two comments on item 4A, which was closed session, a threat to public services and facilities. On item 15A, there's a COVID report 19 uh, update. There were five comments on 16A, discussion action approved start dates and instructional model for reopening 63 comments. On item 16C, discussion action approve a name change and grade span of uh, Monte Vista High School, uh, two comments. On 16D, discussion action approve a gen, uh, agreement with Addiction Treatment Technologies, LLC, DBA, Care Solus, one comment. And on, on the consent calendar, we have 13 comments on item six, uh, 17A2, ratify agreement with MTGL for GeoPeer Foundation Design Theater Project at Estancia High School, 10 comments. 17AB, A, A8, I'm sorry. Um, approve agreement with G, uh, CEM Lab for sports fields at Corona Del Mar High School, one comment. 17C1, approve MOU between NMUSD and NMFT, re uh, first semester elementary report card, one comment. And 17C2-4, approve certificated employment assignment alternative slash options, one comment. Uh, so we will move to um, community input on, uh, let's see, which ones are we going to move to? Agendized. <clears throat> Agendized. It's like, yeah. oh my gosh. Agendized yeah. items, 15A report COVID update. Um, and given the, the numbers, we will, uh, we will do a 20 minute, if that's okay with everybody per agenda item. 
So we'll just continue to read until uh, 20 minutes. And so, uh, where's Rosie? Rosie's in the other room. Yeah, Mrs. Uh, Floor, if, if I may, uh, the way the uh, public comments played out uh, this evening, uh, I would like to do my superintendent's report first. Absolutely, that's okay. And uh, we'll take care of that. And then I believe there's five comments on 15A. Correct. So we'll read those five comments before I give the COVID-19 update. And then we can read the comments associated with 16A, and then we'll move on to that. So, so the comments are tied to the Perfect. item. Okay. Absolutely. That, that works for me. So um, what right. we'll do is uh, we will hold 13 and then uh, Trustee Black, you'll read it after Superintendent uh, Lee Sung's comments on item 14. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, so this is the superintendent's report. So good evening, uh, President Floor, members of the board, uh, my colleagues in the executive cabinet, uh, as well as uh, all the members uh, and community members uh, zooming in this evening. Um, so I, I'm going to segue. I'm going to take Mrs. Ashendorf's uh, information item tonight. I'm going to start with that uh, because uh, what she is saying is music to my ears. Let me let me start with that. And uh, uh, you know I was uh, a music uh, teacher at the high school level. Enjoyed every moment of that. You know, being the high school band director and working with kids every day, uh, teaching in the classroom, piano, and any class that they offered me to, to teach, I, I did, and really enjoyed it. And what she's saying about how the arts are so essential, uh, I saw it firsthand uh, all the years that I was in the classroom, and how music and the arts uh, transforms kids, not only academically, but in every other way. Uh, it truly is amazing what that does, and it is, an essential part of our curriculum here in this district and why I'm proud to be associated with Newport Mesa in its support of the arts, not only here in the district, but uh, in our community as well. So really, really pleased with that. Uh, I'll, I'll add uh, just a, a, another personal touch is, you know, I grew up in an arts family and you know, where my dad uh, is a professional actor. So I grew up around theaters and seeing him perform and, and all of the joy and, uh, and benefits that that provides. Uh, and then that wore off on my sons. I've got two grown sons and one is in film and the other is in music. And so we're truly an arts family, um, you know, not just uh, in profession that way, but just uh, how that really enriches our lives. So I'm very, very proud of our district and what we have done and will continue to do uh, in that area. So segueing now to a, a much more serious topic is uh, the wildfires uh, in our area and the smoke that has affected our community. Uh, and, and I do wanna acknowledge that uh, we, we definitely uh, hope for the best for all of the residents out uh, uh, in that area and hope that they stay safe. Um, we also have had employees that have been affected uh, by this. So immediately as this wildfire started spreading, we started hearing of some of our employees having to leave to go tend to their own homes and take care of their families uh, in this situation. So we know that it hits close to home. So yesterday, as this fire started to grow and the smoke started coming into our community, word got to us uh, fairly quickly. And some of our schools, particularly in the Corona Del Mar uh, zone, were heavily impacted by the, by the smoke. And uh, it was, uh, getting to the level where it was quite serious. Uh, we uh, monitored the air and the air was at very high levels of, of bad air quality. So we knew we had to act. So by uh, that mid morning during the AM cohort, we gave the word uh, to start releasing our kids and notifying parents uh, to have them go home. Many of our, our staff members also had to leave the area. Um, we then started looking at the other zones like Newport Harbor, which is a little further away. So it hit them a little bit later. So we were able to finish the AM cohort, uh, which they were in. And then uh, we had to cancel the afternoon cohort. By then, we also realized that we needed to do this at all of our schools. So continue that, uh, that action and that decision to both the Costa Mesa and Estancia zone. So by midday, we had switched uh, to distance learning. And you know, that is a benefit that now that we have the distance learning option, we were able to continue instruction uh, in the afternoon, even though kids and staff 
uh, were sent home. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that in this situation, when we have an area that is so highly impacted with heavy smoke, our ventilation system, as we've talked about uh, under this COVID environment, that the systems are designed to pull air from the outside, fresh air from the outside, and have that recirculate through our system, through our filters, and uh, with the interior air. So because of this smoke um, situation, uh, we had to make a decision to shut down some of our HVAC units because we did not want to bring in the outside air, which was filled with the smoke into the uh, inside the building. So in our heaviest areas, we did have to shut down the HVAC. Some of the other areas that were less impacted, we maintained uh, those uh, systems running. So this is one of those very, uh, um, you know, minute by minute decisions that we were making based on the information we had, working very closely with Tim Holcomb and Lance Bidnick and the HVAC techs to uh, make the best decision under each individual uh, circumstance. But uh, one of the questions that uh, was brought to my attention was, did the fact that we shut down the HVA system uh, mean that we have inadequate HVAC systems? And that is absolutely not the case. Uh, we have very uh, high quality systems, but uh, when you have such poor air quality outside, uh, there comes a point when you have to uh, shut down the unit. And so it's not due to any inadequate system or, or filters that are not at a certain level. So we did make the announcement yesterday that we maintain distance learning today. So all of our students uh, were in distance learning today. Uh, and uh, our uh, secondary students, of course, are, are continuing in distance learning. However, tomorrow, we made an announcement uh, late this afternoon that we will continue in distance learning tomorrow. Now, we had a little bit of good fortune in that the elementary students were already scheduled for a non-instructional day due to parent conferences. So they were already not going to come into school. So, uh, so they will not uh, have instruction tomorrow as pre-scheduled. And our secondary SDC students will continue in distance learning as well, of course, all of our other secondary students. Now, we are anticipating that the air quality will be better by Thursday. So we will confirm that tomorrow, send another message out to all of our parents and staff to uh, make that official announcement. But we do anticipate that we'll be able to resume back on Thursday. We'll be able to make sure all the HVA systems that were shut down are now turned back on and that the rooms are, are properly ventilated. And we will also make sure that all of our rooms are cleaned and disinfectant as part of our regular uh, process before students and staff arrive on Thursday. And of course, we'll continue to monitor the air uh, quality uh, throughout uh, this uh, wildfire uh, situation and uh, make sure the proper notices and alerts go out to our staff and students and families. So, um, so anyways, we uh, uh, will continue to monitor that, uh, but we do want to get kids and staff back uh, uh, on the job in the classrooms and instructing our students. The next thing I want to mention is uh, this tonight, today marks the four week mark that we opened our elementary schools and welcome back our SDC students district wide. So it's amazing, it's been four weeks. And I just wanna reiterate how um, uh, proud I am of the staff and, and administrators and everybody who stepped up to make that happen and continue to make that happen on a daily basis. I've been trying to get out to school sites and had the opportunity to visit to one of our elementary school sites, one of our larger elementary schools, and to watch the operations of the pickup and the drop-off that occurred. It was a midday uh, transition. Uh, is truly amazing. And how many staff uh, have stepped up to take a job and a duty to welcome our kids, to make sure they're they're maintaining the distance. And I, you know, I watch these elementary students and. And they're really quite cute. I mean, they're there with their masks. They're staying there six feet apart. Uh, they're following directions. And uh, you know, just, just so proud of, of what's happening uh, at our uh, schools. So anyways, but I wanted to give a little uh, kudos to our elementary folks because we have been focusing so much on our secondary. 
And so uh, my report in a little bit, and of course the uh, action item and recommendation is all gonna focus on secondary, but I, I certainly don't wanna forget our elementary students and colleagues and, and families. Okay, so that concludes my uh, superintendent's report for tonight. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Lee Sung. So we're moving on to community input and comments. Uh, so Trustee Black. Uh, yes, my community member is Tim McFadden. Oh, no. would, you, would you read the, the, you the, read the spiel? The spiel. <laughs> that as well. Um, this is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the regular meeting agenda via electronically submitted comments. Each speaker has three minutes of comment read time and per board policy 9323, there is a maximum of 20 minutes of comment per topic. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments depending on the topic and the number of persons submitting comments. All comments are recorded in full on the meeting video. Okay. And so, President Floor, are we, are we doing two minutes? Uh, two minutes, for, correct. Okay, so, sorry, we should have put that in there. Um, again, my um, community member is Tim McFadden, dear um, Newport Mesa Unified School District, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Lee Sun, Cabinet and members of the community. Newport Mason Federation of Teacher remains deeply concerned about the safety of our members, our students and their families. Many of these concerns surround mass exemptions. Since there are mask exemptions, how will parents be notified if their child is in a classroom with unmasked students? What recourse will parents, students, and teachers have if there are too many unmasked students in a classroom? Does the school district have a written policy or rationale for defining that number of mass exemptions in a particular space will nullify the social distancing policy? How many unmasked persons will be allowed in one classroom at a time? We are also concerned about the emergency plans for our sites during COVID and hybrid learning. Do sites have emergency evacuation, i.e. earthquake, fire, intruder plans for the hybrid schedule, including schools with their fields still under construction? What is the district's plan for sheltering in place during COVID? When will the emergency drills take place? When will the teachers be trained on evacuation plans? These plans may exist, we haven't been made aware of them. We are concerned these details haven't been thought through. After all, failing to plan is planning to fail. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm next, I have uh, Dr. Britt Doughty. I'm Britt Doughty, a math teacher at Ensign and a member of the NMFT Executive Board. School nurses report there are quarantined COVID-19 students at each elementary school site. This is very concerning to us as employees and as members of the Newport Mesa community. We are concerned for every, everyone's safety and how the other half of our students' population will be impacted once all schools have returned to the hybrid <laughs> schedules. Other neighboring districts have created procedures to be transparent and let the public know how many infected persons are at each school site. On a separate note, last spring, the Board of Education enacted a revised grading plan Hundreds of high school students received incomplete grades that were supposed to be completed prior to early October. Has the board received a report on that completion status? I am aware that Ensign had only 12 students complete math summer work out of the 150 plus students that received incomplete math grades last spring. I assume high school students had a similar pattern of very few completions over the summer. Teachers do not know how this learning loss will be addressed. We do not know whether, uh, where, whether there is or is not a plan to support these students. We don't know whether we should revise the curriculum and pacing guides that exist or to keep moving forward with what we used last fall. Closing the gap cannot be left up to each school site or individual teacher. There does not appear to be a systematic structure plan to provide academic support on these students. 
a needs assessment should be a good place to start. We need to understand the specific reasons why students were not able to complete their work last spring and are likely struggling this fall. I hope the board is setting an expectation for a robust intervention plan to be created and manipulate, uh, implemented. Some trustees have spoken about the need for quality intervention programs since the spring. Thank you. My, my community member is Goli Aiden or Aiden. Opening the schools to in-person learning or hybrid as the pandemic is getting worse and we are getting spikes all over the country is criminal. We are embarking upon Thanksgiving and we should be able to be with our loved ones without infecting and killing them. It is a terrible idea to open schools when the whole country and the world is shutting down. Any board member who votes for opening on November 9th for hybrid learning is irresponsible and doesn't care about families and especially teachers or their families. Lives before politics and reason before religion. God gave us common sense, let's use it. Thank you. Trustee Yelsey. My comment is from Susan, dear board of directors. I'm a parent of high school students and I hereby am asking you to please get reconsider reopening in November. COVID cases are rising and knowing that we are entering the flu season, it would be irresponsible to open schools, especially knowing high school children won't always have the discipline to adhere to guidelines. Dr. Fauci publicly stated yesterday that, quote, we are not in a good place, unquote. And the winter months will lead to uprising surges of COVID cases. Please reconsider. Children have gotten used to distance learning. They have to go through another long adjustment period to learn the hybrid model, only to inevitably have to return to distance model again once cases rise. Thank you. Christy Anderson. Yes, my comment is from Sandy Gordon. As a Newport Mesa employee, I have some concerns and questions I would like brought up. I have a lot of concerns about the AC at the schools. Some of the schools have had problems with AC not working in the classrooms. Do the portable air conditioners that were brought in have the air filtration comparable to the MERV 13 filters? The portable classrooms do not have the MERV 13 filter capability as promised. Have the parents been informed that these classrooms have a different air filter? Construction on the Ensign parking lot and drop off is ongoing. During non-construction times, it is a nightmare. Now it is worse. The noise and the dust is extremely disruptive to the learning environment. Will the construction be completed prior to November 9th? In past projects, the construction workers were physically separated like all the other school employees and volunteers, and they are moving from their work area to the front office library main gate. Will they be separated from the students and the staff? Will they need to have background checks? Many secondary classrooms do not have six feet of separation between students, even though there is sufficient floor space. The district safety plan state a need for six feet of separation. Will administration be checking every classroom to make sure the six foot spacing of desks is properly implemented? Thank you. So we will move on to uh, item 15, report COVID-19 update. Uh, Superintendent Lee Sung, and I am assuming, knowing how detailed oriented you are, uh, Mr. Lee Sung, that, uh, that you will be able to answer many of the questions that were posed in the, in the, in the comments. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to do a COVID update first, and I will try to embed some of the uh, uh, information connected to some of the public comments tonight. Uh, and then we're going to uh, pause after I do the COVID update, and I believe there's going to be some more public comments read, and then we will um, move to the discussion action item 16A. But first, I, I do want to uh, provide uh, some updates uh, to our, um, our board. Um, so first of all, as you know, we um, have been working very hard and we have never stopped working hard in terms of preparing for uh, reopening. Um, and we've been working very closely with our site principals, almost meeting every single day since then uh, in preparation. And uh, the work has been uh, uh, very challenging, uh, very spirited at times, uh, but we think we're in a very good place to be able to make this recommendation uh, to all of you. Uh, before I get into the, um, uh, the actual report here, I do want to comment on a few of the uh, 
uh, statements that were made uh, in the public comments that we've heard so far. Uh, so first of all, I, I do want to uh, state that uh, there's a comment about emergency plans and doing drills. Uh, that is something that we will uh, still do, uh, no matter whether we're uh, half in cohorts or whatever, it's still a requirement that we have to do our drills. In fact, our elementary schools uh, did an earthquake drill last week as part of the great uh, shakeout. And when our secondary schools come back in, uh, they will continue to do fire drills, continue to do earthquake drills, continue to do lockdown drills, et cetera. Um, there will be uh, some modifications if a certain part of the campus is no longer accessible, um, whether that's for construction, there will be modifications, but uh, those drills and those procedures will continue to uh, take place. I do also want to state something that was shared with all of our principals, just as a emphasis and a reminder that, uh, you know, even though we have rules to follow on a day to day basis, such as the six feet social distancing, when we have an emergency, such as an earthquake or a fire on campus, obviously that becomes the more imminent danger, the more imminent threat. And so that six foot social distancing no longer becomes the most important rule. It is about protecting each other, keeping each other safe. And, and those are the types of, of procedures and common sense uh, practices that we will employ in the event of emergency. So obviously if it's not that imminent and we can still maintain six feet social distancing, we will do that. Uh, but all of these emergency drills and procedures uh, and alterations if needed uh, will be done when students return on person. Uh, there was a comment about air conditioning or HVAC not working. And we have a, uh, a work order process that if any unit is not working, uh, that certainly will be reported and uh, corrected. Uh, those are very routine uh, uh, procedures. Um, there was also something about uh, uh, classrooms don't have MERV 13s. And we, like we have stated before, our standard uh, is to enhance our filters and which we have. We've changed all the filters, we've enhanced all of them. Uh, some areas have MERV 13s and some do not, but we've enhanced all of our filters uh, uh, throughout the district as well as increasing our ventilation um, uh, uh, practices. Um, also, let's see what else I wanted to comment on. Well, there was a comment about transparency. Uh, in just a little bit in my report, I'm gonna talk about uh, our new dashboard to talk about the, um, the uh, positive cases that, uh, that come up uh, in our district. So that will be addressed in just a little bit. Okay, so let me go ahead and move forward with the presentation. Okay, so like I said, we'll do start with the COVID update and then we'll move to uh, action item 16A. All right, this is a slide that I have included in many of the presentations related to uh, COVID and reopening. And uh, I have not changed this since the very first uh, time that I've shared this. And I brought this back because I thought it was important to show the things that we have addressed. Excuse me. Oh. Okay, hold on one second, folks. Sorry about that. Thank you for letting me know before I got all the way through it. Okay, very good. Thank you. All righty. How's that, everybody? Excellent. Okay, so. All right, so here's the slide that I have uh, shared many times in, in several presentations. And again, I bring this back because these are areas that we focus on in our discussion. However, I wanna put a, a little bit of a different emphasis on this. In the decision-making and the conversations that we have and the recommendations that we make, we are weighing, we are weighing these different guiding principles in our decision-making. And it's through that weighing of, you know, do we do this? Do we do more of that, less of this? Uh, that's when we get into those very spirited, difficult discussions. Because in this environment, 
when we do something more in one area, it usually means something less in another area. If we do more of the safety thing, sometimes that means something that might be a disadvantage on the uh, instructional thing. And we have been hearing these arguments over and over and over again. And I just want to point that out, that we recognize that. We have the same discussions and debates uh, amongst administrators, district administrators. I know going on with parents, with students, with teachers, et cetera. And that's what makes this environment so difficult. And, you know, we talk about the social emotional needs. We talk about the relationships. We know that's important. And we know that that's a benefit to get our kids back uh, to school, which is part of our recommendation today. We have made adjustments to the hybrid model that we um, had originally proposed through the support of our uh, site principals. They've been having a lot of discussions at their sites. And so that's part of our recommendation today. So we believe that we're addressing some of the concerns. However, by addressing some concerns, that means sometimes there is something in another area that is lessened, okay? But we're trying to find the right balancing of weighing each of these uh, guiding principles. Now, I, I point out one of, the, one of the bullets on here about um, you know, valuing stakeholders and partners and seeking input. And I certainly value that. We all value that. But I tell you, in this situation, we have been uh, having people on both extremes and everywhere in between on every issue. So tonight, we're hearing a lot of comments about it's not time, we need to delay, we need to wait. However, when we had our last board meeting, we had almost a thousand comments where many of the individuals were saying, it's time to come back, it's time to come back. So I just wanna recognize everybody's voice in this, that we have very different, different opinions, different um, uh, priorities, uh, but our recommendation, as you all know, is gonna be to reopen on November 9th. Okay. So here's a couple of additional pieces of information I want to share. So first about some safety measures that we have added since the last time we've had an opportunity to meet. Uh, we want to uh, introduce and launch our COVID dashboard, which we will have uh, Dr. Jockham uh, talk about, as well as contact tracing procedures in the district. And then I will give a quick update on uh, the elementary waiver that we had applied for. So first, some uh, safety measures. So this is the document that we have been adhering our protocols and practices to. This is uh, from the California Department of Public Health. Uh, this is the guidance. They continually make updates to it, but this is the primary document that we are following. And so there's a number of safety measures, and you've seen this slide before, except for the area that is written in red ink. Uh, what we did do a few weeks ago is we uh, enhanced our uh, requirements in the area of face masks for students. It is now face masks required for all students, even grades two and below. And uh, we still uh, are mandated to offer and provide uh, the exemptions for the masks uh, based on uh, medical or mental health uh, verifiable reasons. And those other things are things that I have mentioned in the past. I want to go a step further now with uh, something that we recently decided to do as a district. And we have been hearing, we have been hearing from a lot of folks uh, about HEPA air cleaners or HEPA air purifiers. So we have decided that we would provide a HEPA air purifier for all of our elementary and secondary classrooms. Okay, this is something that goes beyond what we have already designated to do, which is uh, meeting the standards. So as you know, we've already enhanced our ventilation practice. We've upgraded our filters. Uh, we've done all of that, but we are going a step further and adding these HEPA purifiers in every single classroom in the district. The other thing that I didn't put on the slide, but we will also provide uh, these HEPA air, uh, air purifiers, smaller versions, for areas outside of our classrooms, okay? Based on a as needed basis of our employees who are not in a classroom. So that is in the works and we're very happy to go a step further 
in this category. All right, so here we are at the moment of our unveiling of our COVID dashboard. So to introduce that, I will have Dr. Jockham share about this. Good evening, can you hear me on on your through your headphones great thank you um thank you uh superintendent lee sung president fleur members of the board um we're we're excited to take this next step as a district and i know it was one of the um public comments tonight um although dashboard is not spelled correctly on our um on our sheet here um i we do that every once in a while just to make sure that everyone's paying attention and and um there's no um you know can catch those errors. Um, but uh, I know there was a public comment this evening about um, um, transparency and posting a dashboard like other districts. And we are excited uh, to be able to launch our, our dashboard. And um, if you want to share that, I'll show the dashboard and then I'll talk about our contact tracing process. So what the dashboard does is it is um, listed by school site and it has a total number of staff and students who are at that school site and in the first column and then in the uh, well second column and then in the third column uh, there is the number of confirmed cases at any one point in time. And then uh, one of the important things for us to look at is the kind of proportion or percentage of the school population that um, has a positive COVID diagnosis at any one time, as that's the information that we need when we determine if we're closing, uh, if we need to close a school down or uh, take any further measures for that. So, um, we, if you scroll down a little bit, um, so we have all of our elementary schools, our secondary schools, we have our, um, our special education step program and Harper on there. And um, if you scroll down a little bit, what you'll see at the bottom is that um, uh, as we are looking at the total number of staff and students, uh, this number may fluctuate, but it will be periodically updated as we, um, as we update any of our staff and student information. And then our, our current positive cases is what's reported um, daily. So uh, if we find out uh, that a staff or a student has a positive COVID case, um, it goes through uh, into this dashboard and it stays on there for 14 days. Uh, and we, um, we know that some people who have a positive COVID case can come back to work or to school earlier than that. But we just decided and that was a, a, a safe enough um, drop off date for them to come off the list of, of positive COVID cases. So on any given day, you could see uh, that one goes on or one goes off um, on any given school site. So it's updated on a, on a daily basis. And then um, we do have uh, several of our staff who work at multiple school sites. And what uh, we've done is kind of a, a inverted V symbol so that we're able to show that even if it shows up on different school sites, people realize that this is staff that, um, that, that work between uh, multiple sites so that we're able to um, not, make, not make it seem like there's more cases than we actually have. So um, also within this, on this page within the dashboard, um, there are links to our reporting procedures there's links to when we consider school closures. Um, again, we always find it a, um, a good uh, opportunity to talk about health and hy hygiene and health procedures and precautions. And then there's additional resources. Uh, the school reopening plan has all of this information and we think it's um, important to um, kind of tag into that. And then as, as we um, start moving forward, if there's additional information that we get from either the CDC or the California Department of Public Health or our own Orange County Health Officer, we'll update the information as we move forward. 
So that's the dashboard. Now let me tell you a little bit about one of the other th questions I get um, most frequently is the process for contact tracing. So what happens when we have a student or a staff who um, is confirmed to be positive for COVID-19? And uh, uh, the health services department, Mary Graska as our director of health services, and I have worked really closely with um, uh, Leona in uh, Human Resources and her directors there, uh, Megan Brown and Kristen Clark. And now we've kind of brought Shoshana into the loop of, of the work that we're doing. And it started with really looking at, um, we had employees back before we ever had students back. And so it was really, what are we gonna do to do contact tracing for employees? And the process that we have set up is that an employee lets um, either their supervisor or their appropriate contact in human, relation, in human resources know. So for classified folks, they go through Kristen Clark. For certificated folks, they go through um, Megan Brown. That information is then shared with Mary Graska as the Director of Health Services. It's all documented. We created a log to track all of these. And uh, Mary does the work of um, contacting the person and finding out the information uh, uh, about where they were, who they were with, how, when was the last time they were at work. So HR does uh, a good job of doing kind of the first round of that. And then Mary uses that information to get a little more detail and a little more uh, information. As you can imagine, um, a lot of times people, uh, this process takes a little while because people are uh, rightfully anxious. Um, upset sometimes, concerned about their health. And uh, so we have to kind of walk th through their story with them and find out when were they last at work, who were they around, um, you know, uh, and then we look for what we call close contacts. And a close contact is someone who has been within six feet of the COVID positive person for more than 15 minutes of time. And, um, it's typically within the past 48 hours is the uh, guidance we've been given from the health department in terms of, of going back to looking at when people were considered a close contact. So once we determine if uh, anyone is a close contact, either other staff members or students, um, we have a conversation with the Orange County Healthcare Agency. And that's the next step. We, we share all of this information with them. Sometimes they send us back to get additional information. And then we work together and come up with the next steps and the guidance that we're going to provide. So if we have uh, anyone who is considered a close contact, they are, uh, they are given instructions to quarantine at home for 14 days. That's the process if you are considered a close contact. It doesn't matter if you test, if you don't test, if you are considered a close contact and we have determined you to be a close contact, you're staying home for 14 days, okay? From work or from school, if you're able to work from home and do that, that's what we're gonna work, look at. For students, we have a plan for how they're going to receive their education during the time that they're on quarantine that we've already utilized um, in some circumstances and cases. So um, we have uh, scenarios for when a teacher is at school and kids are on quarantine, when the teacher is home on quarantine and the kids are in school. We've worked through all of those various scenarios. So then we track that information and, um, and we keep a log of all of the information who's considered a close contact. We give them that information. And then there are some people who are considered low risk. And a low risk is basically the same risk that you have just from being in the public at any time. But there are some uh, instances when the Orange County Healthcare Agency has asked that we send a letter. And so we have sent a letter or contacted different classrooms, different parent, sets of parents within 
the AM cohort in the second grade at X school to let them know that there was someone within their classroom that was a, um, a positive COVID case, but this is, and this is what they need to watch for, but they don't need to quarantine. They just need to be on alert, let's say. So that's the process that we have with staff. Then the process changes a little bit for students in that with students, uh, with student positive cases, it doesn't need to necessarily go through human resources. It goes through um, the site administrator and then it goes directly to the site nurse and the school nurse is the one who takes the lead in uh, doing that same work, the same interviewing, the same determining of close contacts when it's at the student level. And then the school nurse works closely with um, Mary Grasca as the director of health services. The, all of the school nurses are able to directly contact the Orange County Healthcare Agency. And then we work with the sites to let them know if there's any students who are close contacts, any low risk, any concerns that we need to be aware of. And then if, if it affects any um, employees, sometimes we have a student case and an employee is considered a close uh, contact, then we work with human um, resources just to let them know that that employee um, is gonna connect with them and figure out the next steps. So, uh, so it's, unfortunately we've had to use the process and, um, but we feel it's a, it's a very comprehensive process. It allows us to determine uh, once we know of a COVID positive case to try and control it through the close contacts, quarantining those folks and then um, moving forward on those next steps. Any questions? I don't see any hands. Okay, I, I have one question and that is, parents are not required to notify the school. Is it mandatory that they notify their school if they have, if their student is positive or if they have a family member that's positive? No, we, it's not a mandate under public health it's, or it's not a mandate. Um, I don't know how you would mandate that. We, okay. um, we okay. definitely, um, uh, ask folks voluntarily um, to, to share that information. And, um, you know, sometimes people will say, hey, have you thought, looked at this person? I heard that their mom, dad, and somebody has COVID. And if we do have information, we act on it and we follow up. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Lee Sun. Okay, uh, just one more item uh, as part of the COVID-19 report. Uh, so as we know, um, several weeks ago, uh, the board uh, gave me direction to apply for the uh, elementary waiver for reopening for all of our elementary schools. And I do want to report back that uh, I moved on that very quickly, uh, met with our uh, two employee um, uh, association, CSEA, NMFT. I met with several parent groups, gathered all the information, completed the application and submitted that uh, by that following Friday, which was September 18th. Uh, I did submit that. I had not heard from the county for quite some time, but as you know, and, and we all have this date in mind, September 22nd was the date that the entire county of Orange uh, was gonna be open to, um, or eligible to reopen schools. So I finally did have a chance to talk to the Orange County um, Health Director uh, who did acknowledge receipt of the application. However, once the county became open and eligible for all schools, they stopped processing applications. So uh, our, our application was not approved or denied. Uh, it is there on file. They're not sure how these waivers would uh, take effect in the future, if at all. But right now, since our county is eligible and our elementaries are open, uh, the waiver really has no impact at this point. Again, I think part of the discussion that we had, we never knew what was going to happen in the future, but uh, our application was submitted uh, and received, but unfortunately not acted upon because our county is open. So that concludes my report on COVID-19.
Mr. Lee Sung, I had a question um, regarding the waiver, just because I've gotten quite a few questions over the last week um, from parents, uh, kind of clarifying that the hybrid model that we're currently in for elementary, the half day model, does not pertain to, can you clarify that it doesn't pertain to the waiver, yes or no? I think some parents are still uh, hoping or under the impression that if we were approved for the waiver, we could go full day. And I just wanted to clarify how that all works. Okay, excellent question. Um, so, so opening means to open in person. And so again, our county was eligible to, uh, for all of our schools to open as of September 22nd. We in our district took action to bring back our students in person. So what you're describing there is when can we have all of our students in a classroom at the same time? Or and I, just to clarify, I don't think the same time. I think that mornings and afternoons with different cohorts on the campus, the, okay, the so initial model we proposed. Yeah, that, that has nothing to do with the waiver, uh, has nothing to do with uh, uh, tiers or anything like that. So, so that, that's the, the question then it, it has no connection to that. So, but we applied for the waiver and the waiver was to allow students back on campus regardless of the, the format. Is that Yeah, it, well, right? every school still has to follow the guidance, which is, you know, the social distancing and the mass and all of that. That really is what causes schools to do various models. It's in order to keep uh, students socially distanced. Did that get your question now? Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we're moving do we have on. An do we have an anticipated prospective date for elementary for going back or? Full time? Yeah. No, not, not at this time. Okay. okay, will we be talking about that at the next board meeting? Right now our focus is secondary, so I, I can't say that we we're going to have that on the agenda right now. Okay. okay. Uh, so, so we're now moving on to item 16A, approved start times and instructional model for reopening secondary school grades 7 through 12 in level 2. Again, want to remind everyone that we have 63 comments. So we will begin uh, and go for 20 minutes on those comments. And Trustee Bartow, you are first. Thank you. My community member is Jennifer Schumann. I am the mother of a ninth grader at Newport Harbor High School, and I am in support of the board approving the secondary hybrid start date of November 9th. Thank you. Trustee Black? Yes, um, uh, my community member is Shelley. Nothing has changed since the last board meeting. Why on earth would we speed up the reopening date? The entire goal of the delay was to work on the items that made us not ready. Those items have not been completed, started, or even addressed. The example, Newport Mesa Unified School District is still not worked with teachers on plans. There's still not agreement with NMFT. Class sizes have not been resolved. No schedule has been set and voted on. No cohort C has been agreed on and created. There are no text updates to make streaming and in-seat instruction possible. We do not have temperature checks for students. We do not have plexiglass or secondary education students except for secondary education students. Just because some isolated but vocal parents want to reopen does not make us ready. We all want to open, but that does not equate to readiness. Newport Mesa Unified School District must be forced to work with teachers to make comprehensive and viable plans. <clears throat> we just sent a representative team to another district two days ago to see best practices, but we have not been given ample time to figure out how to bring those best practices to our site. COVID cases are on the rise across the count country and we are heading into the holidays. This is not the time to rush reopening. Thank you. Uh, I have Aaron Farion. Um, please do not reopen uh, Costa Mesa High School. We were told previously that, am I on, yeah, um, that, uh, that you would not open until the middle of December and we were relieved. Now here we are again worrying about the same issue right before the holidays when the virus is sure to spread. We do not feel that our children and staff are safe in school amid the pandemic and we do not feel that our children's educational needs will be met by the hybrid model. 
Distance learning is the only way currently that our, st our students' educational needs can be met. Why this rush to reopen? It is obviously a purely political decision. The members of the board are not safe to meet in person. You must meet via Zoom. How is it that you feel that it is safe for our children and staff to meet in person? What a disgrace. Please do not reopen Costa Mesa High School at this time. Thank you. Trustee Matoya. Joseph Aquino says, proposing a return to in-class teaching while the nation groundswells with new record high cases makes me feel like I'm watching the 4th of July scene from Jaws. How far is the mayor willing to go to pretend the waters are safe while we, the audience, knows the shark is waiting patiently? Right now, you are the mayor and COVID is the shark, but you can rewrite the movie. Orange County's numbers may be holding steady at the moment, but to believe we will not be affected is wishful thinking and unrealistic planning. I understand the pressures some pockets of parents and youth sports are putting on you to reverse course, especially before an election. But what we are now voting to do is adding to the unfortunate wedge created over the past seven months within our community. The declarations versus conversations, not giving school site administrators a heads up before informing teachers and staff about today's vote for returning to in-class student teaching November 9th unresolved safety issues that go beyond how many students are in a room or who will wipe down desks. Even if you believe your renewed push to return is medically or scientifically sound, for such a quality district, these are shameful optics when great leadership is needed. Your renewed choice to revote two weeks after you led students, teachers, and most parents to believe we would not be returning until the end of the second semester comes across a shameful wordplay. As for the academic aspect of your renewed proposal, changing classes from 45 minutes to 80 minutes for the final four weeks of the semester plus finals will not support the very students you say you're reopening for. Struggling and high-risk students that do not do well will more likely collapse under the changed format versus thrive. And have you done a blind survey with K-6 students, teachers, parents, and administrators to see how it's going since they've returned? Has the social emotional connection we are seeking been occurring? Granted, as a teacher, I may only be hearing the unpleasant stories within the district. But if these stories are employee, that is the end of the two minutes. Thank you. Okay. My comment is from Gretchen Copy. First, I would like to respond to some of the comments made in the last meeting about reopening. President Flora talked a lot about the message that is being sent by teachers working remotely which spurred teachers being forced back on campus with less than three days notice. I would like to address a message the board is sending by continuing to hold its meetings remotely. I am hoping that you all suck it up and we see you masked and in a boardroom tonight. If not, please reflect on your own hypocrisy. I would also like to mention that giving teachers less than three days notice about returning to campus illustrates the utter disrespect and disregard you have for us. It was clear that this action was punitive. Second, Trustee Snell made a very out of touch and ignorant statement that teachers whose rooms are too small to teach can just teach from another classroom. Trustee Snell, if you are not voted out next week, I would love for you to come to Newport Harbor High School and point me in the direction of the 20 extra classrooms we have on campus that will safely accommodate our cohort sizes, since mine is one that is too small. I was unaware that we have extra classrooms lying around. We all know which way this vote is going to go. We knew once you changed the language of the vote that we would not be given the ample time to prepare and have everything safe and ready to go. As I was speaking to a friend in the corporate world and telling her about the constant last minute changing of plans by the powers that be, she asked, why would they just not choose December 17th date, stick with it, and work as hard as possible to make as perfect as possible by that date. Even if the schools are in a better position than they were two weeks ago, why do they feel they need to keep jerking everyone around? It does not seem well thought out and sounds very mismanaged. Pick a date, work toward it, and make everything as safe as you can, and then reopen. I could not agree with this more. Your constant change of plans is creating more angst and anxiety among everyone and plans that sticks basic safety priority. You all could have done a better job. My comment is from Malad Asadi. 
From the destruction of the 4x4 model that we all rejected to the October meeting that delayed reopening, the actions of the board are meant to be taken seriously. However, the recent delay of reopening was meant to incentivize and encourage principals and teachers to prepare their classrooms and schools. A reasonable and comprehensive solution to the unprepared classrooms we will be sending our children to. Was this delay taken seriously by the board that is meant to serve us? Where and are board members checking up with teachers and principals to ensure that schools are safe? Their recent call for a vote to reopen our schools is a clear indication that they are not and that they do not take seriously the resolutions or amendments they pass. For the parents that wish for their children to go back to school, are you certain that their safety can be guaranteed? Are you certain that the well-being of your child is safe? Although it may be true that younger people are not as affected by the virus, you parents are all way past your youth, and if you get it, your safety is in jeopardy. And to the parents who continue to say that teachers are getting money under the table through tutoring during a pandemic, I can't think of anything more insulting to say to our dedicated teachers. Our teachers want the best for us and us for them. This claim has no basis and no evidence behind it. If the board was at all dedicated to our teachers, they would dismiss these baseless claims. For those of you who are legitimately concerned about your child's mental health, speak with them and spend time with them. Attending school where everyone is required to socially distance, stay six feet apart from one another and have limited interactions doesn't contribute much to their social skills, I'd say. My mental health is of great concern to my parents, which is why they take the time out of their day to speak with me and try to understand my issues that I may be facing. Your child's mental health is of great importance. And I know the amount of time that you have at home has exponentially increased since you cannot attend your local soccer, soccer games or go out with your friends to drink coffee and take absolutely horrid Facebook pictures as much anymore. That Does that are the two minute time period, Trustee Anderson? Thank you. My community member is Tam Ho. I don't understand why the district continues to rush the high school reopening date without taking the time to engage all the stakeholders and address concerns first. For instance, if proposing cohort C to give students the option to continue distance learning with their home school, which I strongly support, why not first do a survey to see how many and which students want that option, and from that info, preliminarily plan out the schedules and classes to determine if this is operationally feasible with social distancing. Why is a November reopening date being proposed when, once again, it has not been determined that the modified plan is operationally feasible? Please take the time to plan properly. Let's not rush and set the schools up for failure. Please keep the reopening date until after the holidays to ensure sufficient time for all the high schools to plan a smooth and safe reopening. Thank you. My community member is KM. How can you even consider <clears throat> the school opening when Costa Mesa High School football has already had a COVID positive case with only 20 players practicing at a time but you're considering opening the school for hundreds of students at a time. How is that safe? Thank you. Uh, mine is from Tamara Fairbanks, president of NMFT. Uh, dear trustees, do not make the same mistake as the elementary opening. When elementary opened, there were not enough disinfectant for the fogging machines, so our classes remained unsanitized for the first three weeks of in-person in learning. Workers were on the roof installing HVAC filters until midnight the night prior to the kids arriving. Teachers and aides still did not have enough PPE for their special education classes. Many employees still have issues with having a bathroom break during the workday and can barely eat their lunch. As the secondary gets ready for in-person instruction, I urge you to walk through the campus prior to school, schools arriving. Our ventilation systems did not hold up this week due to our power outages and fires. Corona Del Mar does not have an exit plan for a fire or an intruder drill, and Ensign still has jackhammers in front of the classrooms. Estancia has a decade history of maintenance issues from sewer pipelines that laid exposed, causing medical injury to employees, to a pool maintenance fiasco, both, both were ignored by NMUSD when initially exposed. With the past maintenance issues that NMUSD has ignored, we are pouring you trustees to take the responsibility to walk through our schools and ensure our employee, safe, employee safety. 
Every elementary school site in our district has children in quarantine. We cannot afford that at our elementary schools. We cannot afford to risk our employees' lives and their families' lives because of some failed to ask m &O if there were enough chemicals to put in the fogger. Garden Grove delayed their schools because they did not have enough chemicals for their fogging machines. Our district chose to start date instead of knowing we did not have enough to sanitize the classrooms. Trustees, choose health over politics. Care about your employees for a change and actually take, take a look at what is going on. Walk in the worst classroom at Newport Harbor High and make sure you create a way for that classroom to be safe. Employees can't suck it up if the air isn't breathable. Trustees, it's your job to make it breathable. Thank you. Mine is from Kelly Ebright. It's like the beach. The safest places on shore or out past the waves. The dangerous spot is in the middle where, you, where you're getting pummeled by the breakers. That's hybrid. Not on shore, not out in smooth water, just getting tossed around in the middle. The hybrid system seems very flawed and I don't support it. It seems like the amount of work required to be done independently at home is about to double. The amount of time teachers will have to instruct is about to be halved. It seems it will be pretty much 100% asynchronous work with one hour a week to quickly discuss what's been finished and what's been assigned. How is this hybrid model going to help kids? If they're in junior high or high school, they will go in person twice a week and they will only get plus or minus 10 hours of school per week. How does that help anything? Currently online is five days a week, 15 hours per week. Hybrid means kids will be engaged on fewer days for fewer hours and less contact with teachers. I would prefer to be back in school and not remain at home, but I want my child to receive the maximum instruction time. The hybrid does not appear to provide that. 100% online like they've been doing provides a lot more instruction time. My comment is from Sherry Sharp. As a parent of two Corona Del Mar High School students, I have watched the lack of progress in planning by NMUSD and the board since the summer with disgust and disappointment. At this point, I am hoping that com common sense will win the day and that the November 9th reopening plan will pass. But I believe our community deserves to know that the people in charge are being held accountable for these disastrous results. Are there consequences for not being ready for the October 12th opening? Who was responsible for the plan? What happened? How is the 15 million NMUSD received from the CARES Act being spent? We deserve transparency. My comment is from someone with the initials D and D. I am hopeful that the board will make the right decision and allow our kids to return to in-person learning. Our children have been robbed of almost a year of their lives in this unprecedented time. It is imperative our kids return to school and some sense of normalcy. Studies show that online remote learning has negative impacts for all students, but especially the most vulnerable, disadvantaged students. According to the California Department of Public Health, there are 8.8 .8 million kids under the age of 17 in California. To date, less than 0.1% of these kids have tested positive for COVID, and those nearly all have moderate or no symptoms. Also, there are no scientific studies that show kids under 17 transmit COVID. Schools across the country and across the nation have safely returned schools, students to in-person learning without any negative impact to the health of the kids of the community. Don't rob our children of one more, of one more day of their childhood. Do the right thing and bring our kids back to school. Thank you, Trustee Bartow. My comment is from Kimberly Claydor. Anything we can do to reduce the number of human beings on campus will benefit everyone, staff, students, and the community alike. Reducing the spread of SARS-CoV-2 should be the number one priority and reducing students on campus will help. Are there other ways to reduce the number of people on campus? Please consider all options to reduce the number of people on campuses. Staff members, students, and parents have seen a variety of schedules, and we have no idea what will be the proposed bell schedule for hybrid learning. We have not had enough time to consider the safest models. Bell schedule models need to consider time for passing safely between classes while maintaining physical distance of six feet apart so students can get to next class and teachers can transition. Everyone needs time to wash hands between classes. Meal times should be scheduled in as much as possible utilizing grab-and-go meals. 
During at-home learning, students and teachers connect during the day during the assigned period. What does this mean exactly? Will students and teachers be Zooming simultaneously throughout the day? Will teachers be expected to split their attention between students in front of them and those at home? The only real option for students who will be at home 100% should be to create more online classes. We've been offering online classes to students for years now. We don't even need to spend, send students to Cloud Campus to create more online classes. If we offer more online classes at the school site, students and teachers will have the option of staying at their schools. What does it mean to have student support built into the schedule? It is, this, is it the same as extended learning time like we currently have in our distance learning schedules? Will this time count towards instructional time? If the district proposes training for true hybrid models, this sounds like a good idea. If, district, if the district tries to come up with a let's do this Newport Mesa way and make things up as we go, no amount of training will help us. We don't need to learn a million more new things that have no, we have no time to try and implement. Thank you. Trustee Black. Um, my <coughs> community member is Shirley Yeager, I think. Reopening schools on November 9th seems too aggressive given COVID-19 cases are on the rise. Even though the district may have improved some of the safety issues, the risks are still too high, especially for students, families, and teachers who <coughs> are at high risk of serious illness, even death from COVID-19. Please consider delaying the reopening until cases go down and even more importantly, offer students the option of participating in their classes via Zoom from home while staying at their own schools. Thank you. Mine is from Cynthia Parent. Dear board, board members, I preface this comment with the statement that I want my kids to go back to school in some person learning in a hybrid model. However, I cannot judge if November 9th is the right time because of the appalling lack of details in the district's board agenda announcement of what has changed or improved in the hybrid since the last vote. In checking with some of my high school, uh, kids high school teachers, they were blindsided by the November 9th reopening announcement and have not been provided details either. Did the district administration check with the site principals to find out if the school sites and teachers are even ready, to, ready prior to making that announcement? Or are they just throwing another arbitrary date to reopen just so they can say, yeah, us, um, we are reopening. Before the board votes yes to reopen November 9th, please do two things. One, make sure there is actual improved hybrid plan, not just wait vaporware, and that the plan includes sufficient details to tell exactly how the hybrid model improvements will be delivered. Two, Make sure the new plan sufficiently improves an instructional delivery from the daily, the current daily Zoom-based model. On November 9th, the high schools will only have four weeks and two days of instruction left prior to the finals. And coming back to hybrid well, well, while welcome will, not, will be for an unknown amount of time disrupt learning continuity. If the new hybrid model cannot imp immediately deliver a high quality, a high education value to offset that disruption, wait until second semester. Thank you. Um, my comment is from someone with the initials BK. How are the school prepared for the flu season and COVID at the same time? This will cause so many kids to miss school and lost the funds for the school. Thank you, Trustee Elsie. My comment is from Catherine Miller. Our kids need to be physically present in class as soon as possible. The, dep the depression and anxiety our kids have been feeling due to the inadequate online learning, lack of sports, and lack of social interaction is becoming almost irreversible. The many communications that our kids will be able to return in person and receive in-class learning and teaching has been a small positive light for our kids. After so many lives from our Board of Education and failed promises by the leaders and teachers, we are demanding all NMUSD schools reopen and allow our kids to learn properly and by those who have been receiving full pay plus bonus pay and doing very little to assist our kids. Pediatricians who CDC and AAP all agree that having students physically present in school is required because the harm attributed to closed schools on the social, emotional and behavioral health, economic well-being and academic achievement of children in both the short and long term are well known and significant. Many secondary schools and elementary schools in Orange County have already been open successful 
on campus learning, including NMUSD elementary schools. For several weeks now, Tustin, Irvine, Capistrano, and Saddleback Valley Unified School Districts have all had their secondary schools on campus attending in, in class learning. Our kids are asked to continue to suffer for the remainder of the 2020 year due to incompetence of the NMUSD secondary school principals, teachers, and leaders. How can NMUSD Board of Education find this acceptable? Our leaders, especially the NMUSD superintendent, have not been doing their jobs and should be held accountable to work nights as well as weekends to get our schools up to par with Tustin, Irvine, Capo, and, and Saddleback Valley so that our kids can begin to be physically in class beginning next week as promised over and over again by our principals and supervisor. Shame on NMUSD for not being prepared while others in our county had little or no issues. You have had months yes, to prepare. That is the end of the 20 minute comment period. Uh, thank you. We will now move on to um, item 16A, approved start dates and instructional model for reopening secondary schools, grades 7, 12, and level 2. Dr. Uh, Mr. Lee Sung. Okay, so um, I am making a recommendation to uh, approve the start dates and an instructional model for our secondary schools uh, for level 2, for grades 7 through 12. Uh, I have um, Mr. John Drake, as well as two of our secondary principals uh, with us tonight uh, to join in on the uh, uh, presentation uh, before the board uh, considers this uh, action. Uh, I'm going to start with just a couple of introductory slides, and uh, then we'll move on to some of the details of this uh, revised instructional model. So you've seen this slide many times in the past. Again, I bring that back just to put this in context. Uh, as you know, we have our virtual school, which is the cloud campus. And then below we have the three levels. So what we're talking about here is we're currently in distance learning with our secondary uh, schools moving to level two for a modified in-person model, which it, we're proposing the hybrid. So this is the transition moving to level two for secondary. As you know, we uh, successfully started our elementary uh, students uh, September 29th and then October 1st, as well as our special needs students receiving SDC school-wide. So where we are now in our proposed start dates for secondary is to start our uh, continuation and in independent uh, school, Back Bay Monta Vista on Monday, November 3rd and all of our other uh, secondary schools on Monday, November 9th, uh, with the one exception, and that exception is early college high school, that they would remain in distance learning until further notice due to some challenges that have um, surfaced with uh, uh, providing uh, supervision and making sure that they can continue to do their distance learning classes uh, via Coastline Community College. So our recommendation is for um, all the other schools, Back Bay, Monta Vista on the 3rd, and the others uh, on November 9th. So this is a slide that just highlights some of the features of the uh, revised hybrid uh, model, which still maintains the two cohorts. So I just want to briefly go over this, but Mr. Drake and uh, Mr. Hill and um, uh, Dr. Haley will provide more details of, of this, but it's still a two cohort model and that's important because we need to maintain uh, the social distancing on campus and with half the students there uh, that makes a significant difference. Uh, the other thing is that we continue to have two days of instruction in person uh, on the campus as well as two days of at home learning and one day half day of distance learning uh, per week. Uh, this also features uh, at-home learning where we're enhancing the amount of time and connection and frequency of students and teachers connecting uh, during their assigned period. Uh, we also, you'll hear a lot more about the at-home learning that's going to take place in various different modes and, and uh, methods, but again to uh, increase the frequency 
uh, and the quality of the uh, student and teacher contact. Also, and this is a big feature of what we're proposing tonight, is that there will be an option for students to learn at home, learn at home while staying connected uh, and remaining at their current school. The other thing we heard a lot about was the student support and the original hybrid model that we brought back did not include student support in the schedule. So here uh, we're proposing that there will be a student support. It might look a little different from site to site, but allow students to connect with their teachers and get that extra support four days a week within the Bell schedule. And finally, uh, we have always believed that this is very important is to provide time for our teachers to have ongoing professional development, particularly in this new model. And you're going to hear some details of some of the uh, teacher support that we're going to be providing to teachers, not only before we open, but also ongoing. So there is one half day built in each week to make sure that our teachers have the time for that professional development and to meet with their colleagues and continue to, uh, uh, you know, uh, support their practices and strategies uh, with this new hybrid model. And I just want to state this is not part of the action, but it is something that would be a result of the action. And that is, if this is approved uh, for these start dates, we are uh, going to need to have a non-instructional day for our students. Uh, it'll be a work day, obviously, for our teachers, but uh, that designated day would be Friday, October 30th would be a non-instructional day. And this would be an opportunity for our teachers to do some uh, professional development and again, beginning to make final preparations to transition into this new model. And we had a date in the calendar of January 11th that was uh, previously designated as a non-student day. And that would become now an instructional day to make up for uh, the, the loss of the day. For the secondary. Start. And this is for secondary. So. Make it very, very clear on the top of the slide. This excludes <laughs> special day classes, elementary, and uh, cloud campus. And I do want to mention here that early college high school on October 30th will be a half day. So they'll have instruction half day, but the other half day will be um, teacher pro professional development. Um, if I could make a note, one or two slides before it had Back Bay, it had it Monday, November 3rd on the slide, but Monday is November 2nd. So just to clarify that date. Monday, Monday November 2nd. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so for the record, uh, we're proposing Monday, November 2nd. Okay, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Jake and uh, our two secondary principals that are with us this evening. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee Song, President, Floor Board Members, uh, Cabinet, and guests for giving us the opportunity to, to uh, dive a little bit deeper uh, with our uh, instructional leaders at the sites uh, into this level two model. Uh, to kind of frame our conversation, um, obviously uh, throughout the year, um, especially over the last uh, several weeks, we've taken quite a bit of feedback in relation to the level two model. And that's been the focus of our work together. And when I say our work together, um, that is district staff working very closely and regularly with our principals at our secondary sites uh, and principals working closely with their staffs. Uh, and working through um, some of these issues that we needed to iron out over the last couple of weeks. Um, and, and really our focus has been these four areas. Uh, enhancing student and teacher interaction. One of the, uh, quite a bit of the feedback that we got was that uh, we needed to make sure that on a regular basis with kids being in person two days a week and at home, that every single day there is interaction with the teacher, um, whether they are in person or at home. Uh, as well as uh, increasing the opportunity uh, throughout the day um, to do that. The instructional model also was a big focus of ours in that we were hearing a big concern of not being able to cover content. And so uh, a big focus of our conversation around the actual instructional model was ensuring that we're moving uh, the learning forward in every mode that kids are learning at, whether they're in person or at home. 
because uh, there was a concern that those at home were only going to be uh, reviewing or relearning what had already been taught. The fact of the matter is, and you'll hear our principals talk a little bit more, we're going to be supporting uh, teachers and students to make sure that every single day the learning is moving forward with the same learning objectives and goals that are for uh, classroom kids and kids who are at home. Uh, we also uh, uh, heard quite a bit of feedback around supports for students outside of the instruction. Uh, and we even heard some of our student board members talk about how important it was going to be for them to have access to their teachers additionally uh, beyond the time that they're with them in the classroom. And so um, as a group um, working through that, um, we have identified specific times in our schedules that teachers will be available four days a week for kids uh, to come in along with before school and after school ideas that, that staff are working through. And then again, the, the critical piece that we hear both from staff, from principals, uh, from community, is the need to continually support the development of this model and the instructional approach teachers are taking in this model. We have learned um, when we are uh, obviously um, thrown into a completely new way of teaching and learning that it is over the time of support that it continues to get better and improve. That idea of continuous improvement is critical when we're talking about the support that we'll be providing our teachers. And uh, Dr. Haley and Mr. Hill will be going into that a little bit more detail. Go to the next slide. So before we turn it over to Dr. Haley and Mr. Hill, I wanted to show you a sample schedule. And this is just a sample. So um, each individual site will be adjusting this schedule with their conversations with their teachers as they develop what's gonna work for their site. But in general, um, these parameters will be in place uh, for uh, our sites. So if you, if you look at the first two columns from left to right, um, I wanna stop before you get to that third column because those first two columns describe the distance learning portion of the week for kids. There will be a distance learning day for our secondary students. Um, and that day in this model and in most models that we're hearing from our principals is going to pro potentially occur on a Monday. Um, and you'll see in that model that the um, minutes of instruction are uh, quite a, are about 30, 30 minutes um, for each of the periods uh, on this model. And so that allows uh, each child to have interaction with their teacher um, for 30 minutes on, in this case, Monday for every single one of their classes. And then um, since it'll be a half day, uh, instruction will end around 12.30, 1 o'clock. It allows for um, lunchtime for teachers and then a 90 minute um, uh, session for that continuous improvement professional development for our staff. Um, and that's, you'll see on this schedule from 1.30 to 3. There'll also be a time for department meetings, uh, school-wide meetings, as well as departmental collaboration. Moving, continuing to the right, now we get into the four days of a cohort daily instruction, in-person instruction. And you'll see in that third block there that those are the approximate blocks of time. So our instructional blocks for our secondary schools during in-person instruction will be between 80 and 90 minutes. Um, and so that allows for quite a bit of instruction to take place similar to our current uh, block schedule. And you'll see that they're alternating uh, cohorts. So Tuesday, Wednesday will be um, uh, odd days. So the blocks one, three, five, seven will be covered. Um, and, um, and then cohort A and B will go through both of those. Then Thursday and Friday, our even courses are covered for the cohorts. I also wanna draw your attention um, down to the uh, lower half, the bottom uh, portion of this schedule. And you'll notice that from 2.30 to three on this schedule, so there'll be a 30 minute block of time each of those four days for student support. Um, and that's that block of time that students can reach out to teachers for that additional support, as well as teachers reaching out to students and even groups of students who they've identified may need that, that additional push uh, and support. So in general, uh, this is what, what the schedules will look like. And I say general because times may be different depending on start and end times of different schools. Um, and, and schools will be communicating their schedules out to their communities to make sure that everybody in their communities uh, are, are, on, are on the same page in relation to when their child not only will be attending, but also what the times uh, are throughout the week. 
And so with that uh, idea in mind, what I thought I would do is ask uh, Dr. Haley uh, and uh, Mr. Hill to dive a little deeper into the instructional model, starting with the in-person portion of it. Uh, Dr. Haley. Yes, thank you, Mr. Drake. And uh, thank you to President Floor, uh, members of the, the board, next slide, Russell. Superintendent Lee Sung for having us here to discuss uh, this, this shift as we uh, look at you know, migrating away from distance learning into hybrid learning. And, Really, you've heard this reiterated uh, multiple times throughout the presentation, uh, even in some of the comments as well, uh, which I appreciate uh, not only as being a principal in this district, but I also am a community member and a parent of two students that are in Newport Mesa. So always really appreciate kind of the lens of making sure that you know, we're keeping things uh, in, in mind as we're looking to reopen schools and looking to provide the, the best possible instruction uh, for, for our students, as well as a best environment for our staff and students. So the first is really this emphasis on safety, which has really been at the, the, the paramount kind of, um, you know, kind of body of work that we've been doing uh, with our assistant principals, site uh, managers, working closely with the district to really make sure that um, you can see a real physical transformation of our campuses um, to make sure that we can do everything possible to really make sure that we're emphasizing, uh, you know, the key features in maintaining, you know, masks on, six feet of social distancing, as well as uh, clear uh, paths of travel uh, from one class to the next. Um, it, it's been a real metamorphosis of our campuses. I kind of call it the cocoon before we kind of come out. And we really have transformed uh, amazingly uh, in all secondary sites and collaborated closely as, as secondary principals uh, to make sure signage is consistent as well as um, kind of our, our emphasis on getting the outside of our campuses as well as making sure that uh, we're really looking at the inside of those classrooms for consistency as well. But in addition to the safety of just the physical kind of at campus uh, structures that are you know, in place and all the personal protective equipment that we've ordered and hand sanitizer, there's also that other, I, I think, safety measure, which I really appreciate Dr. Jocka mentioning about, hey, look, we have the COVID monitor uh, for our district, which I really appreciate. Um, we're showing the cases that are prevalent in the district, which again, I think the number was a total of seven. Um, and we, we know that with 19,000 people, as well as life happening, that life is going to change, that we can't be static with our approach. Um, and I even go back to August in conversation with parents about, we have some safety concerns that we can't predict with our own and own family. And a good case in point of that is uh, I've had family members reach out who are really looking um, for guidance because they have a scheduled surgery coming up. And the surgery is dependent on whether or not they can make sure that no family member nor themselves, they get COVID. Because if they do, that surgery goes away. And they were feeling really forked between I don't want to make a decision on my own safety and my child's education, having them switch away from a school that they deeply love. Can't we work together to make sure that we can kind of, you know, kind of move this path forward together, which really is kind of at the heartbeat of what Josh is going to talk about a little bit, which is that at home learning. We want to be able to provide for that family the opportunity to make sure they can go to the doctor, get that surgery, they can do that safely. And then when the time is correct, a student can reintegrate back into campus when it's necessary for that family. So there's really the safety procedures that are not only at the, the school site, but also those safety features, which is really kind of making sure we continue to work with our families in our zones uh, and really reach out to support them in their journey as we all are in this together to make sure that we can do the best we can to support the health and safety, but also the educational outcomes for our students. Second uh, bullet that you see there um, is, is really kind of what you've heard the crux of what this does. This gets students on campus for full days, uh, two days a week. Uh, it provides them, you know, physical connections to their teachers uh, in the classrooms from 80 to 90 minutes, as you heard Mr. Drake say, um, really kind of diving deep with a small cohort of students, you know, 15 students roughly uh, in a classroom to really make sure that they are working through uh, kind of some content and being able to have some positive interactions to move the learning forward and really facilitate that learning. And equally important, you heard some of these comments, is, is the social emotional connections that students just have by seeing each other and being seen. Uh, just even the, the simple task of uh, being called on by name uh, in, in person and being waved to uh, in passing, um, you know, th those things do make a difference in our psyche as uh, we do begin to, again, to open those doors and, and see kids on our campus. Uh, we've been fortunate to be able to have pods of students uh, on campus in addition to our special day classes 
which have been on for four weeks, as you heard uh, Mr. Lee Sung say. Um, and those pods have included our robotics team. Uh, it's been people in our bands. Uh, we've had our uh, English language uh, ELD1 students on campus for multiple days. And just that physical presence, you can just see the smile on their face um, and that connection to school. And also that connection to their peers is extremely important and being able to help as we kind of work on the whole child as we, as we move forward. And then the last, as, as Mr. Drake said, uh, which is super important, is making sure that we're not just relying on those two days of in-person instruction and then the, the touch-ins that are at home via Zoom in the beginning of a lesson and or you know, maybe a high flex model, which you'll hear about, but just making sure that we're really finding time to allow, whether it's at the end of the school day, uh, kind of some, some teacher time uh, to be able to access their students via Zoom and or a check-in, being able to continue to provide learning labs and tutoring uh, access to their counselors and making sure that we can start to schedule those appointments of in-person um, and, and supports, as well as um, our, our school-connected uh, resources, which you know would include turning point counseling. Uh, I already mentioned some tutoring. You know, just the club connection on campus, which is again are ways that students connect with campus. So you put these three together, that's really a shift from kind of distance learning, right, of kind of looking at, hey, you know, we, we don't have some of these things. So the emphasis begins to, again, sharpen uh, the pencil a little bit more um, on these specific items. And we'll go next slide as, as Josh will kind of talk through um, our hybrid learning and at home. Mr. Hill, you might be on mute. Thank you, Mr. Drake. I appreciate that. And I wish I could say that was the first and will be the last time that it's happened. But I appreciate the opportunity to continue this um, conversation about the second half of hybrid learning, which is the at-home portion. I appreciate um, President Floor, members of the board, Superintendent Lee Sung, the opportunity to do this and, and to be a part of this work. Um, we were able to spend the last several weeks engaging staff members, community members, looking at other schools around the district, uh, around the uh, county um, that are doing this right now, as was referenced earlier. We learned a lot in that process. And so I wanna highlight some of those ideas as, as, as I shared tonight with you, um, specifically what, what the at-home portion can include. Uh, first, recognizing that every student who participates in the hybrid model will have um, an at-home portion of their day or week rather. So every student is assigned as Mr. Drake related to us, um, two days to be on campus and then two days specifically to work from home. And then in this process, we acknowledge that there is a third group of students who will always need to be at home for whatever reason. It could be related to the fact that they might have symptoms that morning and we would much rather them stay at home until the symptoms get better than come to school, um, potentially having an illness or, or the virus itself that, that could spread. We also have, as, as uh, Dr. Haley referenced, um, students who um, will, will be sick and will need to quarantine and we'll need to make sure that we're able to support those students. And then finally, um, a, a larger group of students who for various reasons have legitimate concerns about returning to in-person learning and want to remain connected to their school and maybe need to remain connected to their school. Uh, we all felt that the cloud campus was a wonderful opportunity, um, but we also all recognize that there are limitations to what is offered in the cloud campus. And we wanted to find a way to support students so that they didn't have to choose between continuing in a, in a rigorous academic pathway or perhaps a performing arts um, strain of classes and the cloud campus. We wanted them to be able to um, maintain their health and safety and uh, have access to those great programs that we offer at our schools. And we also recognize too that there must be comfort and safety and security um, for a child before they're even open to learning. So forcing students back to an in-person setting when they aren't mentally prepared for that um, is difficult and, and probably counterproductive. So it's important that we find ways to support our students to the best of our ability um, with the limited resources that we do have access to. 
So as we look at this reality that, that we have students who need to work from home, we wanted to be clear that that work that is done at home cannot just be a review of what was already taught. It's, it's not homework time. And one of our concerns um, with this was that uh, there might be um, teachers who, who felt like it, it would just be a, an opportunity to assign more homework for students. Um, if we're serious about completing as much of the content as possible, then we have to move learning forward every day. That means that there's new content objectives um, every day going forward. And we already recognize, and this happened last year too, that there are some things that we're just gonna have to cut out of our curriculum because um, distance learning on its best day and hybrid as well uh, is, is far short of what we'd be able to do in person. So there's already a loss of content and teachers already have to be selective in what they're going to cover and what they're not going to be able to teach. Um, we don't want to further reduce that by essentially having uh, what, what could be covered in a year. We want to continue moving forward every day with new learning. So we've been very conscientious of that and identified approaches to move forward that will enable us um, to do that. And that's really what our work entails from this point on. So as we look at moving learning forward, um, we want to make sure that students, whether they're at home or in classroom, are working toward the same learning targets and goals that are set so that one group is not getting um, better access to learning than another. And then ultimately ensuring that students are connecting every single day, as, as was highlighted again by Dr. Haley, with other students, um, as well as with their teacher, uh, whether they're at home or in person, to make sure that occurs. So how we do this. First, every class starts with a 15-minute check-in through Zoom. So right now, our school board is modeling uh, this approach. Uh, there are different ways of doing it. Um, but right now, what is essentially happening is we have a school board who is together in the boardroom and myself, Dr. Haley, we are zooming in from home. And this would be the exact situation that we would find in our classrooms where we have um, a cohort of students in the classroom physically with a teacher. And then we have students who are at home zooming in to the classroom. So every teacher has been provided with the basic technology to do this. And what we need to do now is help them learn how to utilize that technology and then help them understand um, how to manage the learning environment as they explore this new approach to learning. But it's not something that's foreign. It's just a little bit different. Teachers are very able to work with different groups of students. Um, most of our teachers have classroom setups that afford them that opportunity. Um, typically, and, and something that we've always done. So this is just recognizing now that you might have a group of students joining you who aren't physically in the classroom with you, um, but they are virtually there. So once the teacher concludes that 15 minute check-in, and we've been able to take attendance during that time as well, um, then they're able to proceed, and there are two general ways this will happen. Um, of course, there are many iterations of each of these, but to keep it simple, um, one opportunity would be that teachers would simply keep Zoom on and the students who are joining from home would continue in that setting. The teacher would go forward and, and simply begin teaching, um, whether the camera's on them working on a whiteboard or maybe on their document camera and they're displaying that for the students to see, whether they're in person or at home, students would be able to continue to engage. Now, as I mentioned, this does present some challenges. It does require um, uh, a different uh, acknowledgement and degree of classroom management where some skill will, will need to be built so the teachers are able to do this effectively. Um, but it enables both groups of students, whether they're at home or in person, to be getting the same information at the same time. Um, we also want to acknowledge too that uh, lecturing and, and that kind of an approach um, is not necessarily the best uh, approach. There are other approaches that um, have better results in terms of um, pedagogical effectiveness. And at this point, um, we wish we could have it all. Um, but one of our goals right now is um, helping students um, access the curriculum and access um, each other and the teacher uh, as much as possible. So uh, we would anticipate wanting to be able to enable that. And this is certainly a way to do it. 
Now, the other general approach would be um, that teachers would develop an independent learning activity that would be completed by the students at home. So once they're done with the 15 minute check in, they would then um, direct the group of students working at home um, on what they need to complete for that day. And then those students would leave the Zoom setting and they would begin working on the independent learning activity while the students in class uh, continued on with the teacher with whatever the activity was for the day. Um, those independent learning activities uh, would obviously resolve the issue with classroom management um, because you're not having to manage students in a virtual and an in-person setting, um, but it does present the challenge now of having to develop an additional lesson um, to present to your students. Um, so those lessons will, will involve various aspects of, of good teaching, um, ensuring that teachers have an opportunity to, to model um, or explain what needs to be done and how um, it should be done or, or talk about and relate a concept to students. Um, that could Im involve a teacher pre-recording themselves or it could involve them sharing videos um, of others teaching the concepts or skills that they want the students to learn. But all good instruction includes some sort of, of teacher demonstration of the learning or explanation of it. Um, there's also an acknowledgement that students do need to collaborate. They do need to interact and work together to um, process what they're hearing and learning. And that, that opportunity to process, um, to practice, enables them to uh, develop deeper um, comprehension and, and ability. So online tools are available for students to be able to do that. And they don't have to be in the classroom to do it. They don't have to necessarily be working directly with their teacher. Um, Padlet, Flipgrid are two of the, the common ones that are utilized in our district to provide students an opportunity to interact with each other um, through a, an online method that is done outside of the classroom. And then finally, we, we want students to work with the um, material in um, real life educational settings. And so uh, we see that displayed in, in projects and in, in presentations they put together, uh, research they conduct, um, papers that they write, and, and other kinds of practice activities that teachers prepare for them. So whether they're zooming into the classroom or working on some sort of independent learning um, activity that teachers have provided for them, that learning is moving forward and students are making progress with new content and learning objectives for each of the opportunities they have to learn. Um, the other thing I want to highlight, though, is again talking about that third group. So we need to a pause and acknowledge that there are some students who will not be coming to school on the off day. And so it, it's an additional um, recognition for the classroom teacher that there's going to have to be one more um, lesson prepared for those students um, to make sure that they are able to be supported at home. If they're not zooming in, then they've got to be um, presented with whatever would make up for the in-person learning that they're missing out on. Um, because they're not attending on that alternate day. And so we'll be working with our teachers on ways to support um, students. And whether uh, teachers use one or the other approach here, um, these would be conversations and decisions that we would want them to make um, collaboratively with their teams so that you don't have one teacher teaching Algebra 1 one way and another teaching it another. We want to make sure that teachers are working together, identifying the best methods for delivering the instruction, and then um, helping each other move you know, moving forward together with that. Um, also, one more aspect to highlight about the students who would be at home um, full time is that it, it will also require a, a degree or acknowledgement anyway of a, a greater level of independence that those students will have to display because there is limited um, at, um, access to teachers. Uh, yes, they'll be checking in daily with their teachers for that 15 minute period, um, but they won't have that full 90 minute experience that an in-person student would have. So, um, you know, with our families, as we process the options, we want to make sure that they're aware of that. Um, while I think it's great that we can find ways to support their students at home, we also want them to understand that, that it is going to be difficult and there will be some differences and maybe the activities they participate in um, or that their students participate in who aren't attending school. Um, but at the end of the day, we are most concerned about safety and health um, keeping our students connected to our schools, uh, moving forward academically. And we believe that um, both of these approaches can do that effectively. And so as uh, Dr. Haley and I and the other principals work with our staff, that's what we're doing right now is developing the training to help teachers feel comfortable with these models and then recognizing that it doesn't have to be perfect and it won't be perfect at first. In fact, one of the lessons that was drilled into me as I visited other schools and, and spoke with other leaders um, in other districts 
was that no one has this completely figured out yet, but they were willing to move forward and start working on it now, um, rather than waiting to feel like they were going to have it completely resolved. And, and that, that is why we feel we're ready to go. Not because it's every question has been answered and every teacher is um, comfortable necessarily with what this would look like, but because um, we don't have to have it be perfect before we take that first step forward. Uh, we just need to be ready to take that step. And then we'll continue to um, make progress and reinforce, reteach, support our staff as, as we um, learn how to do this better and uh, deliver what our kids need. All right, so to kind of bring conclusion a little bit, you, you heard in the schedule that regardless of kind of how it looks, this commitment to making sure we're embedding additional supports uh, for students, whether they're at home um, for that day or they're, they're seat-based. And so really building in time as the sample schedule that Mr. Drake showed of having this kind of advisory time at the end of the day or this tutorial time, which could be an invite uh, by the teacher to say, please make sure you come to my uh, advisory at the end of the school day and or just letting uh, students know when they're getting to the week at a glance, which we'll talk about that, hey, I'm gonna have open advisory periods, all are welcome to come to check in uh, in the afternoon if, if, if you so choose to do that for additional supports. And Josh can talk about another way to do that uh, in Bell. Yeah, so some, some teachers might prefer that they have more time in the actual period to um, focus on their students. And so rather than having a separate designated time for that advisory, that tutorial period, uh, teachers would find a way to build in that opportunity to reach out to and check in with their students at home um, in their normal instructional period. So there are different ways to approach it. Um, the, the key is that there is time and effort um, to, to meet with students, to support them, and, and, and to ensure that they're being successful. And then, and then the importance of really make sure we're communicating in the front end, kind of that week at a glance uh, to set the stage for learning. Uh, you, you heard Mr. Hill really talk through the, the variance of the approaches that could be in the instructional delivery. And a, a teacher doesn't need to be cemented in a specific model. They could vary what they want to do in that approach, depending on the topic that they're going to do. So that, that week at a glance will really set the stage so students know what to expect. And an example of that could be if, if their seat-based days are a Tuesday and Thursday, they know that they're going to be working collaboratively in some small groups that are socially distanced, working on an assignment and or presentation that you heard. And then you also know that, you know, students should be doing that via Zoom, uh, maybe the entire, you know, 80 minutes of that class for, the, for that Tuesday uh, when they're at home. But, but the third thing could be, you know, requiring students to practice on their own after that 15 minute check in. So they're not required to zoom in for that entire 80 minutes on that Thursday, because they'd be practicing some of those presentation skills, either via zoom and or just at home kind of making sure that they're going through it. So it allows, again, for students and, and, and parents to kind of know the expectations uh, for the computer time for the week with the kind of minimum uh, target of around that uh, 15 minute mark and, and beginning check in, as well as what else could be expected for some extended learning opportunities um, via kind of some synchronous uh, lessons that are happening or uh, we're kind of using the word high flex a little bit at our site of just kind of continuing that learning together and so then a, a student knows that they need to be logged in the entire 80 minutes and that kind of helps them set uh, their own foundation uh, for the learning week as well. And then we don't want to forget that even before um, distance learning started we already had mechanisms in place to provide additional supports for students. Those involve tutoring sessions, sometimes um, offered by students, sometimes offered by teachers, um, as well as more organized learning labs where students are able to have access to supports that, that were available physically on campus, um, but that really haven't been accessible up until the past week. So uh, those will continue, those will, will be brought back um, as students are able to return to in-person learning. So that flexibility to be on the site again will provide us additional opportunities to be I'm touching down with students and making sure that they are supported um, outside of just what, what would be included in like an advisory or a tutorial or a check-in with the student during the regular class period. We would uh, look forward to seeing um, some of those programs returning to students as they return to in-person learning. And, and as Mr. Hill mentioned, you know, we're, we're diving deep right now with our staff and really looking at that professional development and lesson 
uh, designed for, for hybrid learning. We're sharing best practices with each other uh, via Zoom meetings, as well as we've had some uh, in-person secondary principal meetings to really discuss, you know, the best way to support staff, students, and just school sites as we make this migration uh, to hybrid learning, which will look a little bit different. And so, I, I get excited thinking about the conversations that are happening and what we kind of talk through and um, looking, you know, kind of ahead at our professional developments. Our, right now, I've got an amazing instructional uh, coach team uh, with, with two other volunteers for our uh, hybrid learning um, and hybrid lesson design team. Uh, and, and I've got five teachers that are developing lessons for a week in three different styles. And, and this really is the power of kind of where we're going to make sure that we can meet the needs of our students. And you heard Mr. Hill talk about, you know, making sure that the learning targets remain the same. And so, so, so one mode of doing this is uh, kind of alluded to already is kind of that high flex model. This is the teacher that wants to set the stage for learning uh, and have those students at home be Zooming the entire time while they're you know, talking to the students in front of them. Uh, Mr. Hill kind of talked about the board modeling that tonight. Um, if you had you know, President Floor be the, the, the teacher and then the rest are kind of in the class kind of making sure we're kind of working through together. And then Mr. Hill and I are at home, but obviously you know, the learning is moving forward. And so we've got a teacher designing a lesson built off of that or all of our teachers in, in that model um, and, and our PD are doing that. And the second is what I kind of call the kind of the one two punch approach, which is that real you know, kind of quick check in in the beginning, which is setting the stage for that um, going to be at home uh, asynchronous work that will be again moving the learning along for those students uh, while that teacher will be teaching to the students in front of them that day as well. So developing the same targets that I just talked about in the high flex. But this time developing them with a, hey, I'm going to be instructing to those in front of me, as well as providing that lesson in an in a asynchronous model to those students that are going to be at home that moves their, their learning forward. And then the third is really exploring, and it kind of it is more similar to what I just talked about, that kind of flipped the classroom model where uh, teachers want to do screencastifies, make sure that both cohorts of students are able to watch that, whether they're at home or coming in physically to campus. Uh, the expectation would be that they would do that on their own. They come in, um, they have the 15 minute check in uh, as they come in via Zoom. Uh, that teacher would be then leading them to some asynchronous work that would be related to some of that uh, work that they did in um, that screencast. And then also that allows a little bit more time potentially for the teacher to kind of navigate the classroom and work with those 15 uh, students that are that are seat based. So um, again, geeking out, I'm getting really excited for kind of those three uh, kind of uh, developments in lesson design and uh, our staff uh, along with the other uh, secondary sites and we're sharing best practices of really building as many robust resources as we can, uh, reading articles, talking to our neighbors at, at other districts and around the state and country as well to make sure that we're doing everything we can to kind of help uh, prepare as we get ready for this new chapter and, and we take this step forward together. So super excited about the professional development and again, all staff, hats off to them who are working on this, doing a fantastic job. So with, with that, um, a little bit deeper dive into uh, the design of, of the model. Um, you can hear the excitement, I think, uh, in, our, in our principals to, you know, still in uh, about 10 days time, 12 days time, uh, start seeing kids back on campus and supporting uh, both their teachers and, and students to move uh, the learning forward. So um, uh, along the lines of, of, of um, Mr. Lee Sung's uh, outline of, of this model, we do hope uh, that you uh, take the recommendation to approve to move forward on the 9th of November. All right, thank you, Mr. Drake. Thank you, uh, Dr. Haley and Mr. Hill. Uh, really appreciate your work, appreciate the work of all of our secondary principals who have been involved in these discussions and decisions leading up to this recommendation. I do wanna go back to uh, a question that was uh, asked to me earlier and make a, uh, a correction here. So um, I did have the correct date, but the wrong day of the week. <laughs> so uh, I went back and I looked at the agenda and it clearly was November 3rd. I confirmed this with uh, Mr. Wagner, the uh, principal of Back Bay Monta Vista and it was clearly November 3rd. I had just put the wrong date of the day of the week. So I do wanna correct uh, what I said earlier. It is November 3rd. 
Uh, it is Tuesday uh, that we are uh, recommending as a proposed start date for Back Bay Monta Vista. But November, Monday, it is Monday, right? Monday, November 9th uh, is for all the other schools. So I wanted to make that correction. And so with that, let me move to the last slide here uh, that uh, we are recommending an approval of the start dates and the instructional model uh, for level two. Uh, and uh, I wanna just emphasize that I know that there are many people who feel that uh, we should have opened earlier and people who feel that we shouldn't open yet. Uh, some words are, you know, we're moving too fast, um, too aggressive, this and that. But I, I would say that you know, we do um, monitor the fact that there are districts who have opened already. And we have districts that are about to open now and some right around the time that we're proposing. And some districts who have chosen to wait. So I really do not believe that we have rushed. I do not be believe that we have delayed. Uh, we're uh, making this recommendation with the support of our principals. Uh, and uh, it's a recommendation that we feel it's time to get our students back uh, to school in this model. So uh, with that, uh, that is our recommendation. Uh, thank you. We have a number of uh, trustees who have their hands up and I'm sure that there will be more. So I would like to uh, again, thank you uh, principals and thank you, Mr. Drake and uh, Mr. Lee Sung for the presentation. And we will move to trustee Anderson. Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. Very helpful. I'm, I'm really glad that we um, are here. Um, one of the things that I think stood out to me that um, I am really interested in and um, want more information on um, is the student support section. Um, this year so far we have not had a community alliance meeting. And I know a lot of our nonprofit partners um, and a lot of folks a lot of students need those resources. So um, I was just wondering when we are going to be having that. Um, and then also, you know, last year about this time, we had around 100 students who are experiencing homelessness and now we have up to 300 um, that are housing unstable and are homeless. And so um, I just wanna make sure that all of those needs are addressed and taken care of and that we're providing access to those nonprofit partners that they know what the needs are, but then also that um, our, our school communities know what is available to them. Um, and then this, so the second question that I have is about the process for this cohort C for the at, her, at home learning. How does a parent or a child sign up for that? What can you walk us through that a bit more? What does that process look like? And then how will that impact balancing cohorts? Well, and then my third question is, um, what will be the process or be around cl the cloud campus? Um, initially, we had a hard deadline that if you're in cloud, you couldn't leave. Now there's more flexibility. If there are students who want to return to their home campus, what is that process? Um, and then for students who may not necessarily want to do at home learning or any of the hybrid options, are they allowed to go in? So those are my questions for now. Thank you. So uh, Mr. Uh, Haley, if you wouldn't mind uh, talking about your process for cohort C uh, yeah, and so what that's gonna look like and how that's gonna impact uh, uh, your potential cohorts. Sure. So I'll kind of answer it backwards if that's okay. So, so regardless if someone's going to exist in that at home or, or cohort C, right, we're, we're going to assign everybody to cohort A, cohort B to make sure that we can balance just in case uh, they, they choose at a different point. Like I mentioned earlier, they need to be at home for a little bit, but then they reintegrate back to school. We already have that built in, right? So we're already assigning regardless um, kind of that cohort A, cohort uh, B, and then it was about a month ago, um, district sent out a survey that again was related to uh, getting close to the potential reopening of our schools into a hybrid model. Um, we have copy of those survey response of those who had um, indicated some health reasons or other reasons that they did not feel comfortable. We have a list of those uh, people that have um, 
conducted that survey and our plan on board approval, we already have the survey written, is to re-email back to those people that have indicated that they were uh, not comfortable at the time to come back to school and just connect with them. And then we plan on having individual phone calls, conversations with them to really talk about kind of what it would look like uh, to remain at home and the supports that we can embed in at school, um, as well as be able to support them in their learning. And as you heard Mr. Hill say, it will be, you know, a little bit more of an independence that they need to have. Um, but again, that's where we're going to start is already with uh, those families that indicated on the survey just over a month ago that that was something that they need. And then, of course, you know, deal with kind of some some new, um, you know, people that might need that just based on circumstances changing as they move forward. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Haley. Uh, and then as far as the process for the cloud, so um, we do have a uh, wait list. So a general, general statement we can say is for cloud in or out, uh, we uh, are recommending that we wait until the semester to do that, uh, to maintain what has started for kids in the cloud and, and complete that uh, to uh, the end of this semester, as well as bringing anybody into the cloud would be the semester. Those people who are interested, um, uh, in coming to the cloud, we'll still be able to maintain uh, their, their uh, teaching through distance learning that they're currently in um, with their uh, connection to their regular school. And that the semester, we could bring them uh, into the cloud. Okay, and I'll ask uh, Dr. Jockham to uh, respond to Trustee Anderson's first question regarding um, community partner support. Great, thank you. Um, yes, it's unfortunate that the number of our homeless students has uh, gone up about 100 students in the past in the past year, and we know that um, a lot of this is due to um, just the financial ramifications of of um, everyone dealing with the COVID pandemic. So um, we are still um, very committed to. Um, to meeting with our community partners. So we do have um, a, uh, a community alliance uh, meeting uh, that was, um, unfortunately it was um, canceled because it's the, uh, it was scheduled for November 9th, the first opening day of our secondary schools and um, our support staff is out at those schools during that time. So um, what we are going to be doing is holding um, um, smaller meet and greets with those community alliance partners. So it's not maybe the big group, but it's gonna be some smaller groups coming together to meet on that. And uh, we're hopeful that once we get kids back in school, we can look for how we can bring those community partners back on campus um, safely uh, to be able to meet the needs of students. So um, we, we would not be where we are without our community partners and we want them to know that. Um, we really appreciate the work that they do and we look forward to continuing with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Trustee Barto. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. It's great to see how you guys have all worked together and I can see elements of each of your uh, leadership styles, all you principals uh, on this. So thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to check in, just making sure I understand for each segment, uh, regardless of what day, there's a 15 minute Zoom review at the beginning, correct? Okay, so whether you'd sit through the in-person, which is fine, you'd have the in-person and you'd have the Zoom catch up and then the other day if you're home, you'd have a Zoom catch up that day. Okay, great, thank you. Um, what do, are we doing regarding, regarding student support? I've heard a lot of feedback from Newport Harbor, from Coast Mesa, I'm not sure if it's Coast Mesa, but another um, campus about the need for AVID tutors and their ability to come back. Um, do we have any updates on that and how that's going to be addressed? I guess there's a, the AVID tutors are concerned they're not going to be brought back is what I've heard. Um, so I wanted to make sure that that's not, you know, that they, maybe they just haven't heard yet because we haven't approved this model is kind of what I wanted to follow up on. Yeah, I mean, our goal is to bring back all of our tutors and to uh, have them do what they do uh, to support our kids. Uh, you know, we've been taking things in stages and certainly when we get our students back, we'll find the best way to do that. 
Uh, there are some logistical challenges in a distance learning environment uh, that made that very uh, challenging. Uh, but once they're in person, uh, again, following all the guidelines, we can uh, slowly start to bring them back in. Okay, thank you. And then um, my second to last question is, what, uh, do we have any methods that we've considered thus far regarding accountability for students attending um, doing their assignments, but also for teachers um, being able to connect with their students. And if um, some teachers are struggling with the, the new model, do we have a way to support them? Um, uh, yes, so part of that is um, principals uh, being involved uh, in the classrooms uh, and in the Zoom sessions and in the classrooms okay. and monitoring. Um, and then as you heard Dr. Haley talk about, I think the approach that we're, we're taking is, you know, with the practitioners, uh, identifying those, those classrooms um, that, that are, uh, you know, effective and, and utilizing those teachers as a resource for other teachers. Um, I know that's the, that's the model that Mr. Haley and uh, Mr. Hale have talked about. Um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Haley, if you want to add any to that or, or uh, Mr. Hill, but, but the idea being that identifying those, those practices that are happening and utilizing your teachers as a resource to support other, other teachers moving forward. Yeah, I, I can expand a little bit. I mean, I think just the, the ability to be able to, you know, do physical drop-ins are going to really help. Um, you know, that, that's a way to just get a quickly kind of temperature check of what's happening in the classrooms, as well as then just the ability to follow up with the teacher after that during their prep period, kind of say, hey, when I came in the classroom, here's what I observed. How's it going? Tell me some things that are successful right now. What are you maybe having some difficulties with? So kind of those informal check-ins, I think, can really support. And then it's back to those professional development days of allowing time for people to communicate about what's going well and then, you know, what maybe those struggles are so we can really take that with our team to develop some supports and structures to help us move forward. Because as, as Mr. Hill said, it won't be perfect, um, but that's that's the beauty of growing and, and, and getting better at the practice and being committed to that. But we need to be open to the dialogue and provide platforms for that. So it's that professional development, department time, as well as now the ability to physically kind of do some drop-ins and some conversations. Thank you. And then um, my other question is, what can you kind of walk me through the plan that you have to communicate uh, these new protocols, expectations, et cetera, to your teachers? And I'm sure that will vary by school site, but I, um, what does that look like overall? Yeah, so I, so, so I can take that. So, you know, kind of obviously waiting board approval tonight to kind of move forward. Um, just, you know, kind of forecasting where and the amount of professional development time that we have left kind of gave a potential highway for what that looks like, you know, an opening to the ninth. Um, as far as our protos protocols for safety, we've gone over that already in anticipation of the earlier date. And then as far as, you know, really the the kind of lesson structure and builds, those would be things that we're gonna do collabor collaboratively together um, for us. And I think most of the other sites targeting Friday and or uh, some, some afternoons uh, on Wednesday or when um, distance learning is done. So it's just that kind of, kind of constant setting the stage uh, to move it forward. Um, and then I think all school sites have hybrid instructional committees, uh, which really, as Mr. Drake said, are, you know, like for us, our drivers are five classroom teachers, you know, working closely with our assistant principal of a curriculum and instruction to really make sure that it's, you know, kind of ground level momentum moving it forward and they become the communicators to their colleagues and their peers about, all right, here's what we're thinking for lesson build, lesson design. Um, and then the last component of that is um, we're working with Jenneth and her team uh, to bring ed technology in to make sure that we know how to maximize our ability to use the technology in front of us, whether it's the docking station, a new camera that we have, maybe some kind of food for thought, how to make sure that we're doing the best we can kind of moving that forward. So it's really kind of partnering with all those groups, I think, and, and communicate, you know, for us mostly via email about the path ahead and then those structured meeting times on Zoom. Thank you. And then my last question is, do we have some kind of process in place? One question I uh, hear a lot, um, community teachers, staff, et cetera, is the uh, PPE. And it sounds like most of the PPE has gotten to the school sites. Do we have kind of a system or checklist or something at the different school sites, sort of like you'd see posted in a 
elementary school office of the things that have, have been done um, just so that people can kind of see that that stuff is there and if it needs to be replaced, it can be sure to be prioritized. Yeah, I can start with that and then maybe Mr. Hill can kind of finish in. So uh, Dr. Kwong, our middle school principal, built a beautiful Google form, which uh, a teacher fills out. So the teachers are kind of monitoring the environment and if they need additional hand sanitizer, we all get email notifications that, you know, uh, Michelle Barto in room, you know, whatever is requesting seven more hand sanitizer. We have three days. We always give ourselves three days to deliver that. We usually beat that. So that's been our process and it has every single PPE item uh, that um, has been provided to us by the district uh, on that list. So if they need something else, that's how we're monitoring it. Um, and so it, it's been extremely effective so far. Thank you, that's very helpful. Trustee Elsie. Oh no, Trustee Snell, I'm sorry. I have three screens up, that's why it takes me. It's Okay. Um, I appreciate the uh, flexibility of the cohort uh, C and the fact that you can go back and forth. That, that is a great idea. So you're assigned to A or B. And then if you need to quarantine or you start to feel safer about coming to school, you can go back to school seamlessly. That's, that's great. Um, just to clarify, it sounds like the way cohort C is handled differs by school, by classroom. Some um, teachers may be doing a Zoom during the class and some teachers may not. Some teachers um, may need to learn more to do it. Some teachers, uh, that particular group of teachers may uh, feel that they don't want to do that. Is, am I hearing that correctly? That there are two different options and different, it would depend on um, how they, um, an individual site decides to do it, an individual subject decides to do it. That's right. I'll, I'll uh, start and then ask uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Hill and Dr. Haley again to add any color to it. But um, all students uh, at home will receive uh, 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 at least a 15 minute check in. Yeah, that was um, and that, that situates them. And then depending on, uh, you know, how the teacher has designed that at home learning to move learning forward. Um, it could vary from class to class or department to department. Um, that may look uh, like uh, the, the asynchronous model that was described with some screencasts or uh, things like that, or it could be along the lines of independent project research uh, and, and could be even done uh, with groups of kids outside zooming together and collaborating together around, uh, you know, a learning objective. Uh, but, but a lot of that will be left up to uh, kind of teacher discretion, teacher expertise based off of whatever that learning objective is and whatever is going to best meet that objective for kids at home. I don't know if there's anything else to add, uh, Mr. Hill. No, I mean, it was covered really uh, in, in a lot of detail. Um, no, I just want parents to know that if their child is, if they place their child in cohort C, it may not look the same. And I think it's important that uh, each of the parents uh, realize that or there's going to be um, disappointment. So, um, and I also realize as teachers get more trained um, on this, um, more may decide to do the Zoom during class. Um, and so, but I, I thought that was important to be clear about. Um, I have a couple questions about, um, about early college high school. Um, I noticed, uh, and we all noticed that they are planning on, they want the option of not opening until seconds, until January. Um, and I guess, um, I don't know um, if Principal Martinez is on, on line here or not. Is he? No. 
Um, because I would be interested in knowing, I know there are some issues with uh, collaboration, coordination with Coastline, but uh, freshmen and sophomores, I don't believe they take college courses. I believe their courses are just A through G courses. And I, I just think it would be um, uh, interesting to find out uh, why um, they couldn't return um, at the same time, um, at least the freshmen and the sophomores. And, oh, are you gonna make him a panelist? Okay, that would be good. I'd love to talk to Principal Martinez. Um, so either may, having the, the freshmen and sophomores uh, go back on the 9th, and um, if not, um, if there's some um, plans for how to engage these students in um, uh, in-person learning that maybe isn't exactly have to do with their college class because I, I've heard from a lot of um, early college parents that that want to go back they their kids want to go back and um, so I'm interested in in what we're doing for them okay mrs. Snell do you have any other questions while we're waiting to uh, get him on board um, no, I noticed also Estancia High School isn't, isn't outlined, but I'm assuming that um, it's the same type of thing for Estancia High School. It's just they don't have the six classes. Correct. Okay. Right. okay. No, I don't, I don't at this point. No. Oh, it's coming on. Oh, good. Okay. All right, Mr. Martinez, I, I see that you're on now as a panelist um would you like to uh provide a little more information about some of the challenges that you have with uh, distance learning and alignment to community colleges i just centered in right now i hope everybody can hear me i'm on a computer that doesn't have a camera so that's why you only see my name So to answer the first question, all grade levels are in college classes. So we do have uh, freshmen and sophomores in college classes. Uh, in some cases, we have um, students that are taking two, maybe even three college classes within the regular bell schedule at early college. So it's available at all four grade levels. Um, we, we know at this point that Coastline College has to stay in remote learning uh, the entire time for this semester. And uh, in order to adequately supervise our students, as uh, Mr. Russell Lee Sung mentioned at the beginning, is that there is a supervision component that we need to work out uh, with the district, make sure we have the, uh, the appropriate person to be able to supervise our students while they're on campus remotely participating in Coastline College classes while they're on our campus. And because uh, the, the personnel uh, cannot be on our campus, the adjunct professors. So uh, that's, that's another component uh, for why we're on a, until further notice because we are not able to put out a date as to when that would be in place for the students. So it sounds like uh, there's, um, as long as is, um, college personnel can't be on campus, there's no way that you would be able to um, open earlier and uh, with the potential problem of even opening um, in January. Well, it's our hope that we would be able to get this all ironed out by January, if not earlier. Uh, we, we're, we're under the impression that it's by uh, or no later than December 17th. So we've, I've told my folks that, you know, we need to prepare ourselves in the event that we are in a position to be able to open up later in the semester. It just doesn't appear that this critical piece can be put in place at this point in time uh, by the November 9th date and uh, it would be later. So that's, uh, that's a big piece that we are dealing with right now. Uh, are there any um, opportunities for students to come on campus to um, interact in any way, distance, you know, to actually do some sort of a interaction on campus that maybe doesn't have to do with the college course, because I know those students, many of them are struggling 
because they're not having the interaction with other students and with teachers. Are you looking at some options um, to do that? Yeah, we've, uh, we've proposed what our small groups that we wanted to have back on our campus. So starting you know, next week, we have groups like our ASB and our yearbook that we're planning to have rolled out. Um, we even had stated that even if we weren't in a hybrid model, if we could have students in our NPR be supervised by the appropriate personnel that needs to be in there, that we would have uh, small groups of students who would maybe rather just be on our campus to do their classes, uh, to be in the company with each other, um, even if we weren't in formally in a hybrid model. So uh, we, we put those proposals together and also we are hosting an ROP class uh, for the very first time. It's an after school class on Mondays. It's going to start on November 9th. And I've already been in communication with ROP that we're going to allow those students to come back in a cohort model split to take that uh, five hour class that's happening once a week. So it's happening from four to 9.15. So those students that have already started that class will be able to do that uh, on Monday evening starting on the 9th of November. Okay. Thank you, Dave. That's, that's a good start. That's what is the um the ROP class? It's medical careers and health systems. And Wonderful. there's uh, 31 students. Yeah, so there's 31 students in there from various campuses in the uh, crop region. And uh, we just split them up almost like elementary style. We're going to have a, a two and a half hour cohort starting at four to 630 and then do the switch off and uh, the second cohort coming at 645 and 915. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. I have a follow up since we have Dr. Martinez. Um, so there's a, there's, um, it looks like in the daily pilot there, the chancellor for CCCD said that Coastline Community College District is not coming back in the spring on October 5th. So I just wanted to know, it sounds like, I love that we're doing the ROP thing. So I just would love if we can continue to think through small group ideas and ways to get some of the kids on campus for tutoring and to interact with some of their teachers if possible because um, I think that continues to be a concern. Thanks. Uh, Trustee uh, Snell, you're finished, so we'll go to Trustee Elsie. Thank you, uh, President Floor. Um, first of all, I want to thank Mr. Lee Sung, Mr. Drake um, for recommending this and especially to the principals, Dr. Haley, Mr. Hill, and all the other principals that you've worked with. It's clear that you put a lot of time into this and, um, and a lot of thought process. And we, um, we get, we've gotten a lot of comments from the public that we're changing our minds. And we said we weren't coming back till December 17th and now we're coming back earlier. Well, when we voted, we said no later than December 17th. And at that time, I believe Mr. Lee Sung, you tasked the principals to come back with a plan if they could get it together earlier. And it's clear they put a lot of effort into this to make this happen at this point. So I, I really do appreciate this. I know that at the individual schools, the principals are all working with their staffs, with their parent communities and with the students because I've heard from some people in all of these groups and I think that's a great thing um, that they're all feeling part of this collaboration. And so I hope that continues on as we move even when we come back. Um, and as Mr. Hill said, it's not going to be perfect that we're gonna to have to take steps along the way, but we need to get back. I think, you know, Mr. Lee Sung, you, you always talk about um, the prior, the guiding principles ever since the beginning, and you talked about it again tonight. And we always list as the first one, priority, prioritize health and safety, which I think we do. But as you mentioned, we can't just do that and that be our only priority because we'll never open anything. I mean, literally probably for two or three years, nothing would open. So I think we need to look at the other things like support social emotional needs. To me, that is becoming increasingly necessary. I talk to parents, 
We've talked to kids. Several of us were on the mental health task force last week where we heard directly from kids. But I've talked to many parents who get emotional talking about how their children who are normally well-adjusted children, they're not the kids that are normally on our radar, and they are struggling to get through this, to not being on campus with their peers. So when we talk about health and safety, this is part of health and safety. And I think we need to be aware of that. Um, and then deliver a quality educate teaching and, and learning. We wanna do that, but I think we're all realizing we may be sacrificing a little bit to make sure all these other things have are happening with the kids coming back. So, um, I appreciate all the work and all the the changes that have been made to the original uh, recommendation where we are having kids who can stay remote if they want, who where we are having a 15 minute check in every morning. And that was something that students brought up to us in the mental health task force is they wish they had more time for to just chat so people would be aware of, of their state of mind. Um, at any given time. So I, I do appreciate all the changes. I have just one question and maybe um, I don't know who can answer this about technology. Have uh, Mr. Lee Sung, I believe you've met with your cabinet and some people about what's the basic technology we need for the classrooms going forward, but also are the individual schools working with their teachers to decide, I mean, it may not be what's best for one is best for all. So are they looking at different options that different teachers and classrooms can use? Okay. Yeah, let, let me uh, respond to the technology part, which obviously is a, a very important part uh, if we're gonna be doing in-person instruction and stay connected with kids at home. And I wanna start with internet connectivity and the Wi-Fi that we have on our campus. We had a, an incredible meeting uh, with all of our secondary principals with uh, Austin Bobovich, who's our uh, director of, uh, of IT. And uh, you know, one of the questions, the first question, basic question is, you know, do we have the Wi-Fi capacity, the bandwidth to uh, provide this? And uh, he provided some really incredible information. I, I don't have all the numbers in my head, but basically the, the bandwidth and the capacity that we have increased over the years is pretty significant, is really significant. And even on a day where we have high use, we barely even reach half of that capacity. And so uh, he, uh, based on all of his analysis and all of the uh, reports that he has in terms of usage, we have plenty of bandwidth. And there is also a, a hub or how that's connected that uh, were just recently replaced throughout the district. So he assured us that, uh, you know, that we, uh, you know, have the Wi-Fi capacity, which is, I, I think, the first thing that uh, principals wanted to know and, and get more information. So they have that information. Any staff member or parent who uh, wants that additional information, uh, they can pr uh, provide that to them. Uh, the second thing we talked about is what type of added technology do we need at this point? Because as you know, we've gone one-on-one. -on -one. We have new laptops for teachers, uh, document cameras, uh, all of that. Uh, but what else do we need to be able to support this type of instructional model? And so we had a very deep conversation about that. Part of the conversation was also, what did we see in other districts that have already opened and doing models similar to this? And you know, surprisingly, there's not a whole lot of extra technology that's needed. But the one thing that we did identify is to have a higher quality webcam, a higher quality web camera. And so once the principals uh, you know, identified that as something that's needed with our uh, director of IT there and um, our director of purchasing, who was part of that meeting, immediately we jumped on that and said, you know what, we will support that. We will get the web camera for every teacher to uh, help them deliver this instruction. Now, on top of that, another item that came up was the microphone, was an enhanced microphone. And so, uh, again, deep discussion on that. And, and wouldn't you know it, there is a device that has webcam and a microphone built in. We get a two for one. So we immediately identified that and the brand, and we're moving forward uh, to purchase that for all of our teachers. And beyond that, there might be individual teachers who, who 
want this. They, you know, they might want a speaker or they might want headphones for their kids to, you know, th that, that's something that we don't have to do across the board. Okay. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, individual uh, teachers working with their sites can look at adding those things. But what we wanted to do was to hit the main item, the big item that we felt was important for every teacher. And that's the one we're moving on right away. Thank you. I appreciate it. Is that it, Trustee Yeltsin? Okay, Trustee Matoya. Thank you. I was unmuting. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your wonderful questions. You had me cross off most of mine off my list already. And of course, thank you to the sites and the district staff that have worked so diligently and wonderfully to get the refinements made that are already done. One thing I would like to check with both principals as just a sample, because I know this happens at all schools. Um, Dr. Haley, you talked about having a hybrid instruction committee at your school site. And I'm assuming that while you guys get your heads together and really just come up with these great ideas, that you're not doing it in isolation, that you have site staff or teachers that have already come back early, the ones that chose to work out of their classrooms early, and tapped into their knowledge. So this is not totally an administrative decision. It is also done with teacher input. Am I correct? Yes, yes, you're absolutely correct that, you know, we're, we're for sure utilizing um, not only, you know, staff who volunteered to be a part of it, but also, um, as you know, part of our structures at our school sites are to have instructional coaches those are teachers that are released uh, one period, so they teach five classes, and then there's six classes for instructional coaching. So we're using their expertise to help kind of model and drive some ideas forward. And then for us, right, and then that goes forward tomorrow to our school site council to really start talking about those with our greater school community. And Mr. Hill, I was just, Mrs. Yelsey, uh, Trustee Yelsey alluded to this, but something similar happened at CDM, correct? That's correct. Um, we, we all also found ways to tap into um, our parent resources, our students to get some of their input as well. And of course, it's not finished yet. I, I feel like we've started those conversations. Uh, we need to continue them and we need to get better at this moving forward. So those are, I, I think we all have plans to continue um, certain aspects of these committees moving forward. Absolutely. I thank you very much. The two of you were just our, our samples and Dr. Martin. Tina's, I know you're out there in Cyberland, and I know that you also do this. Um, my second point question was on parent communication. I, I responded to most of my questioning that I got over the weekend with, well, our principals are cautious with spreading things out until the board has approved a plan. So it's not that they're trying to keep you in the dark, they're trying to do things in the proper order. Um, now that once we have made a decision on this, one way or the other. Um, I told one of my parents that you would be inundated with communication coming from the site. And was I accurate or was I overreaching? Yeah, I think most of us met with our families prior to um, October 12th. And I think we all recognize we're gonna have to do that again, just to make sure we're all on the same page. We hit those, those points again and let them know what this looks like moving forward. There are some components that are different um, as we knew they needed to be. And we'll have to be clear with families about the process for at-home learning um, and some of the other um, things that we'll be implementing. So parents watch your email inboxes and school loop notifications. And the last point was when we started, when Mr. Lee Sung, you were talking about the technology that we had on our campuses and, and how we have a strong Wi-Fi band. But every school has just like, if you know if you're driving through Corona Del Mar, you can lose anybody. Every school has that one room or corner of a classroom. And that's what we were hoping would be discovered having the teachers coming back without the students. We'll find them now. And I know that there's, techno there's technology to boost that room or amp that up, and we can find that now. And, I'm, and I just wanted to bring that to the attention of anyone who's still left listening, that it wasn't it wasn't a willy-nilly decision. There were so many positives by having the teachers back on campus, other than the fact that there's a wildfire and no one can be on campus right now because it's 2020. Um, 
so those were answering all of my questions and thank you very much thank you uh trustee black uh, first i have a question an important one did the dodgers win the world series Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I can hear. You know, um, somebody just ruined it. It's actually, three or four people ruined it for me. I, I was going to wait to watch the game after this. Uh, meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. oh well. That's okay. Miss Zielte, I was listening to crowds cheering, so I just made that oh. assumption. <laughs> sorry to throw you under the <laughs> under the bus there. Um, but I, first of all, I really do appreciate all the hard work because I do know um, this was very stressful for everyone and, uh, um, and it's a challenge. And, but it is really hard for us to hear our students who reach out to us, begging us, you know, to have some kind of, uh, you know, positive semblance at their school. They, they feel like they're really missing out. Um, so I'm going to, everyone, my colleagues, everyone ask great questions, and I think the report was very thorough. So I will be the downer and ask, we have, I've received so many community reports from um, teachers. Is Newport Harbor ready for, do we have those 20 spaces or what are the classrooms? Um, are we able to do, you know, bring in the cohorts? and that Newport Harbor is ready to accommodate? Yeah, so um, I actually went um, and, and visited Newport Harbor, uh, talked to Principal Bolton, uh, been checking in with him. Uh, you know, they've been working really hard to A, try to balance the cohorts the best that they can, mm -hmm. and also finding spaces on campus. And you know, it's, it's tight over there. There's not right. a whole lot of extra space, but finding, um, larger spaces that uh, teachers uh, can move to if, if their classroom uh, is too small and their cohort mm -hmm. is too big. So it's a combination of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And little by little, it's getting down to a, a reasonable number. Uh, I do want to make this very clear that the uh, state guidance um, says to maximize student space between, uh, between students in a classroom. Right. Even though six feet is our target and what we try to do, uh, there's situations where it's not going to be six feet, it might be five and a half feet, uh, but, uh, but they're, they're working really hard to, to balance that out. They were removing furniture from mm -hmm. the classroom, again, to kind of free up as much space as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were really working hard uh, on that. So the other thing that we've offered as an option, if there's a, a classroom where it's not six feet, uh, that we would provide the clear plastic uh, screens uh, for mm -hmm. those classrooms. And so teachers uh, have uh, received those, they're in the classrooms, they've been delivered mm -hmm. to the sites. So just another uh, level, another layer mm -hmm. of precaution that we can put in mm -hmm. in that situation. Uh, Trustee Black, I've asked uh, Sean, he's, he's on his way, Dr. Bolton's on his way in, so. Oh, good. Well, I have to say, I really appreciate um, you know, everybody working so hard together. But I think you're right, um, Mr. Lee Sung, that we really need those teachers at that site to help guide us, you know, when we're making those changes. And so um, I think that that's, you know, going to be really uh, in, important when we start on November 9th, you know, for them to get a feel of how this is going to work. And, and like our elementary teachers shared with us, that they were pleasantly surprised to have so much support from the district. Once they entered their rooms, they could actually visually see how it was going to work. And so I think um, it's really going to be helpful. And there may hopefully be some <laughs> relief on that and less of the fear. So I appreciate all that support. Uh, Dr. Bolton's on. So if you want okay, to Okay, great. Sean, are you there? That's one nice thing about Zoom, is that we can get them anywhere. I know he's here because I saw him. You're probably on mute, Sean. No, he's here. He may. I saw him. Where'd he go? He may have lost the Wi-Fi. 
Okay. When he comes back on, we'll. Um, okay. Um, I I do have a, several questions, and um, I first want to preface with a, a couple of things. One is. Um, a lot of references were made to me saying something to the effect of suck it up. And, and I think that we're all sucking it up. And it was not meant to be pejorative, but it was really about, um, especially for teachers, because teachers, despite everything that's going on in their, in their home life, their, you know, the personal life, they have to suck it up and they have to present and look really great in front of their kids. Um, wherever they are, they have to they have to put on the happy face. They mm -hmm. have to they have to teach. They have to motivate, even though their lives in the background may be going to hell in a handbasket. Excuse my French, <laughs> but that, that's what teachers do. That's what m makes them such professionals is that they really are sucking it up and going out there and being the consummate professional and teaching. And that's what I meant by sucking it up. We all are. Um, and I think that goes to the point that, um, John, in, 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 our, in the model, we talk about professional development, but I'm hoping that also we have some method to provide, well, we're, we talk about always the emotional and behavioral support of, of kiddos. All of us need support. You all here at the district office, because you're working 24 seven and teachers are working 24 seven. So I'm hoping that within that model, within that design, there is a mechanism to provide that emotional support that teachers may need. Um, I think it's really important that, that we support one another and that they have that ability to let their hair down, so to speak, um, and not always be focused on, on professional learning, but really talking about that. Um, I do have some sort of pointed questions. One is, um, so Estancia High School is on the four by four. So are they doing the AB cohort or they are, or they is, how is, how does that work with the, how does that work? Cause they're, they only have four classes. They don't have a, so are they doing two, I mean, are they meeting more often? So they're AB. I mean, I'm trying to figure out, well, how do they work? They have four classes, and so they have an A and a B, but still the A so, will so have they'll, twice. So they'll still have a, B, a days and B days, right? So they'll still have two cohorts. So kids will be coming to, to each of their classes. Twice. Oh, twice, yes. correct. They'll, they'll also still have a distance learning day work in as well. So where so would, if they're they're odd scheduled, so what uh, one three five seven. Monday is one three five seven for A. Tuesday is one three five seven for B. Wednesday is one three five seven for A. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then this is kind of a weird question, but so all, are we assuming that all kids will have a four period day? And that they'll, or will their classes be consecutive? So if you're, if you have periods one, three, five, and seven, do you have a, you know, before it used to be you could not be on campus, period three, and you'd come to school one, and then you'd may go home or go to the library, and then you'd go to five and seven. So is it, are they consecutive? So every kid's going to be actually having eight classes? No, the, the kids will have the same classes. So I'm going to actually uh, kind of lean on the experts here and what that will look like and how that will play out in these models. So Josh and, and Jake, for your high school kids, um, what, what will those uh, schedules look like if they've got three classes as opposed to four classes? Yeah, so we work really hard to make sure that that open period is either at the beginning of the day or the end of the day. Okay. So it would be a free first or second or a free seventh or eighth. And I think all of us have a very small number of students who might have a third or a fourth period open. Um, but we're usually talking about, you know, less than 20 students, maybe in the whole campus. But later in the day, earlier in the day, you'll see larger numbers of students. And we would just ask them to come later, leave early um, based on when they need to be at school. Okay. One thing that I'm really excited about is that T. Winkle and Ensign will be on a block schedule and they will have two, basically they'll have two electives, correct? 
right now they only have one because there are six period days. So now we're going to a four period a day or eight classes. So is that my assumption is that the middle school will be functioning in the same way with a one, one, three, five, seven, because the middle schools have two electives. So will they be doing the uh, same thing? You're talking about, you're talking about at the seven twelve. uh, Site. No, I'm talking about the I'm talking about the schools that don't have 712 that typically have three periods. Uh, uh, yeah, they have they have six periods in one day, which is three periods, and they generally their periods are uh, 55, 60 minutes. Now they're going to a 90 minute period, and there's they have seven periods. I yes. Mean, they, yeah. So they'll have four periods a day, correct? Uh, it depends. So both those uh, site principals are working through those conversations about schedules with their leadership okay. teams and their staffs uh, to figure that out. Okay. Um, and a question was brought up, and, I, and it's a very valid one from uh, Dr. Dowdy, and that's the learning loss and addressing the learning loss um, that our kids, we know, let's accept the fact that we've had learning loss. We may have some kids that have had minor, but we may have lots of kids. How are we, how are we addressing that learning loss? Um, are we doing assessments? Have teachers been doing assessments? I know that in, in Saddleback, my kiddos, my grandkids, um, they, they did actually did assess, uh, literally assessments of where they were now. Granted, they're kindergarten, first and third grade, but they did an assessment to, to assess where they were and that, how much learning loss there was so that they, they knew that they could build, they had to build that into their, into their classes. Are we doing the same, are we doing something similar at, at all our grade levels? Yes, I um, so one of the things that we've, we've talked about um, uh, quite a bit is, number one, uh, learning loss is, well, um, kind of exacerbated with, with this pandemic and, and our delivery of, of um, teaching and learning in this mode, it's not new. So when we think about assessment, uh, teachers should be regularly assessing their kids formatively to identify what they need to do um, in order to support them having access to their uh, grade level content. Having said that, um, a, a formal uh, assessments and things like that um, are starting to be done at the elementary level uh, as we've returned. Um, but that in-person piece will also allow teachers a little bit more access to identifying what it is that they need to fill in in order to give kids access um, to the, the grade level content. And so that's, that's the approach we're taking. Um, not, not easy to do. Um, and so there will need to be you know, additional time and support for kids uh, worked into the day. Uh, as and, and you heard Dr. Uh, Haley and Mr. H uh, Hill talk about those tutorials before and after school times, along with some of that time uh, of intervening with kids uh, within the classroom. Okay. And again, I want to thank um, the principals at the secondary level. Um, we heard you loud and clear when we first made the decision to delay, and we've heard you loud and clear that you're ready to go back and really want to meet the needs of your students and, and really appreci appreciate all of of that hard work. I guess the bottom line is from my point of view is adjustments are gonna be made. We don't, you know, we're gonna be continuing to adjust. We're gonna be continuing to be having to be flexible. What happens this week may be a little bit different and we're just gonna roll with the punches, I guess, and, and, and work on that. Um, my final thought is we're, we're dealing with the, the, hep, the, what is it, the Flex C, is that what we're calling it? The Flex C model? The at-home students, the yeah. Ham. At, yeah. Are we are we looking? Are we? I don't want to bring it up, but because I don't want to talk about it now, but I'm going to bring it up. Are we doing this with TK through six too? Are we looking at? No, we have not. No. Uh, okay. No, we have not designed that. Okay. All right. Okay. Can I call for the question? You got it. I don't. Th I don't have any other hands up. I think everybody's addressed all the questions. Mm, okay. Did you have something to say? Okay. Well, I think uh, Trustee Elsie, uh, Trustee Snell, you want to make the motion? Yes. I am um, in light of um, everything being um, uh, safe for our students and our staff, as um, decided by the um, Orange County um, Health Department, um, and in light of all the great um, up 
upgrades that have been done, I'd like to move that we uh, start secondary for, um, I don't know, do I need to denote the four schools for? Grade seven through 12. Seven through 12, mm -hmm. um, with the exception of early college high school um, for Nove to begin on November 9th. Okay, is there a second? Trustee Black. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Snell and seconded by uh, Trustee Black to approve the start dates and instructional model for reopening secondary schools grades seven through 12 in level two. Um, I know that uh, Bailey Bogard, she is a student board member, um, uh, is going to be voting on this. Bailey, do you, I didn't know because uh, she had, she was having some difficulty, Bailey. So uh, if you'd like to share that, because this is your opportunity just to, you are the coach, you are the co-chair of this semester. So I wanna give you the opportunity to, to say something. Of course, thank you. Uh, so after having multiple discussions with the school board representatives and um, having them listen to the entire um, night tonight with the board discussing everything, the pros and the cons, hearing from the public, um, there is a five to two vote. So five being no on going back on November 9th and two student board reps voting yes for going back. So our vote overall as a majority uh, is a no for the student board members. Okay, thank you. So we will do roll call and Bailey, you will express the, the majority of your, of your colleagues. Okay. President Floor, I just wanna make sure that part of the motion is also the uh, November 3rd date for Back Bay Monta Vista. Correct, okay, yeah. as amended. Is that okay with you, Trustee Snow? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, roll call please. Student Board Member Bailey Bogart? No. Trustee Floor? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Trustee Black? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Snell? Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. yes. Great. Thank you again. Thank you, Bailey, for all of, of your hard work. I know that was a difficult decision, but it was a smart thing to do. You're representing well your, your colleagues. So moving on, the motion carried uh, seven zero. Moving on to 16B, very exciting. The appointment of the California School Employees Association Chapter 18 representative serving on the Personnel Commission. Uh, Ms. Mrs. Olson and uh, Mrs. Clark. Thank you very much, President Floor, members of the board, executive cabinet, and guests. I'm actually going to turn it over to Kristen Clark, our administrative director um, of classified personnel, to do the to do the honors here tonight. Thank you so much, President Floor, members of the Board of Education, and Superintendent Lee Song. I think that's the first time I've gotten to say that. Um, Newport Mesa has adopted the Merit System, which is overseen, as I'm sure you're aware, by the Personnel Commission. And this is a body that's independent of the school board that is authorized by the state to be responsible for certain personnel matters affecting classified school employees. The commission is composed of three members who are appointed for three-year staggered terms. One commissioner is appointed by the Board of Education representing your interest, one by the classified employees exclusive representative and one is selected jointly by the other two commissioners. Um, the term of office for the California School Employee Association chapter um, 18 appointee Susan Meyer expires this December 1st. CSEA has recommended that Ms. Meyer be reappointed for another three year term. Susan Meyer is a long-term Costa Mesa resident who has always been very deeply involved in our community and our school district. Um, she was originally um, served as our personnel commissioner back uh, in 1996 until 2002 and was reappointed to the commission in 2011. She has a very strong and sincere advocate for all of our classified employees and she is a champion of our merit system principles. So it is with immense pleasure and pride that I recommend that the Board of Education approve the reappointment of Ms. Meyer to continue her service on our commission. 
And Ms. Meyer is here tonight, um, if you would like her to address the board. Absolutely. Where's Susan? I want to, here I am. I want to thank uh, CSEA Chapter 18 for asking me once again to serve. It is a great honor to serve uh, this district. Uh, my, my son went through this district. I am a longtime res resident. Actually, I've recently moved to Newport Beach now, uh, still in the district. And it, it's, it really is an honor to serve. Um, and it it's, it's just been a great pleasure working with the administrators and the employees of the Newport Mesa Unified School District. I know that we are providing a great service to the district and it feels good that all of the employees that go through the commission are highly qualified for their positions. Thank you. Thank you. With that, may I have a motion please? President Floor, I move to um, approve the uh, recommendation. Okay, Ms. Second. Uh, Trustee Matoye, okay, it's been moved by Trustee Black and seconded by Trustee Matoye to appoint um, uh, the appointment of the California Employees Association Chapter 18 representative, Susan Myers, to serving on the personnel commission. Uh, roll call, please. And we roll call slowly, so maybe Ms. Anderson could be back. Yes. Trustee Floor. <coughs> yes. Ugh. Trustee Yelsey. Yes. Trustee Black. Yes. Trustee Barto. <laughs> yes. I'll come back to Ms. Anderson. Okay, perfect. Trustee Snell. Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. I don't believe she's coming back. Okay. So, um, Trustee Anderson stepped away for a minute. Is there, is there a way to amend that um, when she comes back? Is, there, is, it, is it legally allowed if she comes back that we can amend it? I think we can make that for the record when she comes back. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now we're moving on to item uh, seven, 16C, discussion action, approve the name change and grade span of Monte Vista High School. Oh, there she is. Vote. Just in time. Okay. Trustee Anderson, your vote on the appointment? Yeah. Of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Motion ca carries 7-0. So we're now moving on to um, item 16C, discussion action, approve the name change and grade span of Monte Vista High School. We have two comments on that item. Um, so it's- I'm first. Mrs. Floor, I'm first. Okay. Okay. Um, this comment is from Dennis Ashendorf. Thank you for merging the Cloud Campus into Monte Vista High School. Monte Vista can support an adaptable future of treating both students and parents as individuals. Clearly the need to serve your students with Monte Vista Secondary CDS code is critical. Not being familiar with the ed code, please ask if a school may have two CDS codes, one for elementary and one for secondary. If so, a better name for the school would simply be Monte Vista School in the current application. Although adorable, Cloud Campus is a technology, not a name, and it will be strange for a diploma to read Monte Vista High School slash Cloud Campus for independent students. No one attends Estancia slash Brick Campus. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Um, the easiest current solution would simply to have students enroll in Monte Vista High School, an A through G approved campus, and not bother with the CVS paperwork. Frankly, there was no real need for a new high school and its costs in the first place. A TK-12 Monte Vista school would serve all parents in Newport Mesa by offering courses that meet individual needs and pacing without the various social promotional promotion problems plaguing conventional schools. Furthermore, students taking online college or career courses wouldn't necessarily work alone. They could have a cohort, a home base. There are many other advantages to upgrading Monte Vista. If the cloud campus motivates the changes, great. 
Still, online courses are just one of the improvements that Monta Vista can offer to the entire district over decades to come. Publish Monta Vista. Let it absorb and host our current online efforts with the focus of TK through 14 integration into the future. Let Newport Mesa serve all students, including those transitioning out of high school. The next comment is from Tamara Fairbanks, NMFT. Monta Vista has had a successful independent study program for years. Although it is simple name change, I have a question of whether or not it could change the programs at the Monta Vista campus. How come the cloud does not have its own campus? Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee, uh, Mr. Lee Sung. Okay. Yeah, let, let me respond to a couple of those questions and then I will turn it over to Mr. Drake. Uh, but uh, first of all, we, uh, we're, we're trying to solve a problem with the cloud campus and getting a CDS code uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, in, there's a lot of uh, reasons to, to do so. Uh, but to have two separate codes, uh, that would warrant a, a pretty lengthy process to uh, get a separate code for the uh, two, um, two schools and two different levels. Um, there's also um, uh, no change to the program. Uh, it's not going to affect the program at Monta Vista or Back Bay and certainly uh, the cloud campus is underway so it should have no effect. There was also a question about a diploma. So what we put on the diploma, whether it says Cloud Campus or Monta Vista High School, uh, that would be up to the district. So that should not affect that as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Drake to give a little more information on this item. Thank you, Mr. Lee Song. Uh, yeah, so uh, just a bit of uh, history. Uh, as, as you recall, it was around June when we received direction to create a, uh, a virtual uh, opportunity for our students uh, based off of their needs. Uh, you know, entering into, you know, the dealing with the uh, pandemic and, and continuing to, to move the learning forward. And so in a short period of time, we created the cloud campus with uh, Dr. Shaka as, at its lead and uh, support to do that. Uh, currently, we've got 2,000 students involved in the cloud campus, about 1,200 elementary students and about 700 secondary students. Uh, the CDS code is uh, also, it's, uh, the, the acronym is County District School Code, um, and each school needs to have one. Uh, it's connected to the state, and it, it uh, allows for accountability, tracking, funding, all of those things, and every single school needs to have one. Uh, as, as Mr. Lee Sung alluded to, it is a lengthy process to get a CDS code, so knowing that we needed to do this, we started to uh, interact with surrounding districts and find out um, how they went about getting CDS codes for their virtual schools. And we found that um, most of them did exactly this. They um, combined the in name, the, um, their um, independent learning schools um, with their virtual schools uh, for the purpose of acquiring that CDS code, which is required in order to support uh, the kids moving forward. And so in finding that out, we have uh, Monta Vista, uh, there uh, and uh, are, are recommending that we uh, join the cloud campus uh, um, with Monta Vista in name uh, so that cloud campus can also have that CDS code that's necessary. And I say in name uh, because part of that requirement is to not only change the grade levels since we're a, the, the cloud campus is a TK through 12 school, um, but also uh, the, the name of the school would be recommended, we would be recommending is Monta Vista High School Cloud Campus. Um, nothing as Mr. Lee Sung ch uh, said changes for Monta Vista. Um, Mr. Wagner is still a principal at Monta Vista uh, and those students who are involved there continue with their independent learning and CD the CDS code then also applies to the cloud campus uh, and all those requirements uh, apply to, to the cloud campus. So we're asking uh, the, uh, that, uh, or with this recommendation that you approve uh, the, the name change for uh, the acquisition of a CDS code for the cloud campus uh, uh, to Monta Vista High School cloud campus. This is uh, really uh, something that we can revisit uh, uh, towards the end of this year, if that's something we would like to do. I 
have I have two yeah. hands. Let's see. I have two hands up, Trustee Snell, and then Trustee Anderson. Um, I I believe that the whole um, idea behind the cloud campus was it for it to be a separate school, for it to have its own um, its um, own um, um, identity. And so, which is what um, the principal is trying to build right now with um, moving this forward. Um, what I would like to know is, is the plan in the future to actually get its own code? And we're just doing this because it takes too long to, we, and we need that code um, for, by the end of the school year. Is that true? Okay. So yes, we're planning on making it, giving it its own code, and um, okay, that's what I wanted to know. Uh, Trustee Anderson. Um, yeah, I had a question about, um, there was one part of it where it says um, that this code will be used for students to register and to take their AP exams. Um, and so I was just wondering how that works. So if a student was typically a student at Newport Harbor, but then their AP exam for this one year would be under a different campus, is that is there, you know, a special note that is on their transcript? How is that handled, or is that just going to be kind of something typical during this season? You know, if someone is at one school for a majority of their high school years, but then for one year is like, I just want to know um, if there's any negative or positive to that, or if that has any um, implications later on. Um, and then I think that this is a good idea. I think the board still has to decide if the cloud is a viable option going forward, if we need it or not. Um, so um, I think this is a great short term option. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, uh, Trustee uh, Matoye and then Wait, Trustee Bart. Can yeah. I get an answer? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you made a statement. <laughs> so, uh, we can't hear you. you yes, uh, Dr. Jockham is checking out the answer, oh, getting it. the okay. answer. She's getting, yeah. she's going to get the answer, okay? And then we'll come back. Okay, Trustee Matoye. I keep forgetting to mute back up again, so I'm very I'm trying to be more careful. Um, and Cloud Campus is the name that the school selected. It wasn't a description of what it was. So I remember at the beginning when um, Principal Shaka came up and presented to us, we're going to name it. We've all voted and it's the Cloud Campus. So Mr. Ashendorf, it really is a name. And I guess we don't have a brick campus on our on our, st our staff, so that's all. Um, Trustee Barto, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if there are other options because um, I know people who join. So this is only one year, but the name on your high school diploma is like forever, and um, I think that's really important to a lot of people. And you, um, I also know that. At Monta Vista, they recently had these lovely masks made. There's a lot of school pride, and it's um, it's it's great to see them kind of band together through uh, this pandemic. And I'd hate to kind of just for one year kind of solve a problem when, in the long term, I think the cloud campus is not going to be part of Monta Vista. Or you know, I, I just think it's if there's a way to be creative, I think we're making a short term a quick decision that's going to have longer term consequences than we think. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, under the, the, the time constraints that, that we, you know, were in to create the school uh, in a short period of time and then looking into the amount of time it takes to get an individual CDS code uh, and knowing that is the example in the uh, agenda item being you need to have a CDS code for kids to sign up for the AP exam. Um, obviously, there's transcript uh, issues for seniors to graduate and things like that. Um, we do need to, to get the CDS code in place now. Um, and we can revisit this again in the springtime where we have the time to get its own CDS code. But there are implications for us that if we don't move forward with this, 
um, you know, could be a problem, a bigger problem. Uh, so uh, agree that, that there may be better I ways to solve this, um, but, but with the time constraints that we were under to create the school and uh, provide this option for kids, it's going to be, this, this is the best option we have right now to acquire a CDS code for our, our kids in this school. So, but it, would it be something we could then revisit in the spring? Absolutely. The, the graduating seniors could have a diploma that was, a, you know, there. Yeah. So, want, for the, so the diplomas, we, we can, do you want to take that, Sarah? Or, go ahead. No. So the diplomas uh, are, are ours. Diplomas will say whatever. That student decides to have, whether that student wants correct. to be Cloud Campus, Monte Vista, or Corona Del Mar. Correct. Or so the, wherever. The, the, the diplomas can say that. My for this year. For this year, yes. Okay. Yes. So if it takes so long, why, why would we not be starting that process now? Well, so I, that July, come July 1 of next year, Cloud Campus basically has its own CVS versus waiting until the spring to go for a new, I mean, I just, I, I, I'm not opposing this because it's a short-term solution, but I have a concern about saying, well, we're going to, we're not going to, we'll decide on in the spring whether we're going to have a, whether they're going to be a separate one, whether versus saying we can't vote on it now, but directing you basically to say, start the process. If it takes a long time, we better start the process now. Yeah. So we will start it once we get schools open. <laughs> a lot of our attention and efforts have okay. been to opening uh, our high schools and uh, middle schools. Okay. Um, but but we will we will get to it as, as quickly as we can. Well, and see that begs begs the bigger dip issue is because I know that this year we have been discussing restructuring and looking at Back Bay Mon not Back Bay but the Monta Vista model, um, and so is that part of is are we are you going to be talking about looking at that or was that but that got put on hold because of covid so i guess we're gonna just you'll just wait on that too the overall yeah. concept yeah. okay works for me okay so does that mean that the cloud campus will have an official address of 390 monte vista avenue is that where the 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 everything will go to uh, <laughs> I think it's appropriate that Monta Vista now has a logo because right now they, you know, we have the Bulldogs. <laughs> so, yes, I believe it will. Um, I will double check and get back to you on that. Um, but, but, okay. But it will have an address. Great. Okay. And uh, Trustee Matoya, you had another question? Okay. Okay. So, uh, May I have a motion to approve item 16? Oh, do we, we read them. Okay, 16C. Excuse me, President Floor. Did you want the answer to yes. this? Yes. Okay, so um, uh, uh, I, I reached out to um, Dr. D'Agostino in terms of being the um, custodian of records for the district about um, uh, 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 Trustee Anderson's question about AP and um, he said that where a student takes an AP test is not relevant and um, in, in terms of what's on a diploma or transcript. And um, we're four weeks away from AP testing and we need to order the test now. And the only way we can do that is if we have this other code um, to be able to access that. So, and he does, um, we do all the diploma um, uh, ordering and stuff for for how we're going to do them in the district so that is something that we can um, uh, decide how we want to look at that for each for each situation moving forward so thank you very much that's clear it's just a technicality thank you That makes sense to me why we would need that code now, but is there a way that we can message this? Because if I'm going by what's on the agenda, um, I don't understand 
all the stuff that we just said. And I know a lot of people go off the agenda and that's gonna cause so much confusion. So I just like to get ahead of the confusion and communicate that this has nothing to do with your diploma. This has nothing to do with your school's name. This is something we're doing for the AP tests and allows us that in school to have the AP test because I, yeah, for this year, because I think, or, you know, however long it is, but I think it's really important like I said, I'm looking at Martha's mask and I'm looking at all the school pride that they had and I really don't wanna take that away from them. So just when we message this, let's maybe make sure that we're really clear on uh, what we're doing here. But I would, I'm gonna word it in such a way that that might help. I approve that we approve the name change and grade span of Monte Vista High School to Monte Vista High School slash cloud, cloud campus TK through 12 for the 2021 school year. Rosie, did you get that? Yes, so um, Christy Matoye added yes. um, for the 2021 school year at the end of that motion. Okay. They also added TK through TK 12. TK through 12. Monta Vista High School slash Cloud Campus, TK through 12 for the 2021 school year. Yes. Perfect. Great. Is there a second? Trustee Black. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Student Board Member Bailey Bogart. Yes. Trustee Floor. Yes. Trustee Yelsey. Yes. Trustee Bartow. So, yes. Trustee Black? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Snell? Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. Okay. Item car uh, carries, motion carries uh, 7 0. Okay. Moving on to item uh, 16D, we have two comments on, or one comment on 16D. Uh, Trustee Anderson. Yes, my comment is from Cynthia Blackwell. I was deeply touched by the sharing that occurred during the recent mental health task force meeting. I was also deeply disturbed that every single counselor, psychologist, social worker, community facilitator, school nurse, and administrator was not on the Zoom meeting to hear firsthand from students. There appears to be a huge disconnect seven months down the road. Now it appears that even more money is being requested for yet another program. The concern is how will the students know about this new program? How will the staff know to refer students? How will families be notified of this program? What type of follow-up will occur? More and more people are experiencing mental health issues across all economic spectrums. Mental health should be a top priority. More counselors are needed at this time. Students need to feel that somebody really cares. Oh, gee. Okay. Uh, so we are at 16D, that's an, uh, to approve the uh, agreement with Addiction Treatment Technologies, LLC, DBA, Care Solis for the 2021 school year. I have Trustee Barto. Yeah. President Floor, uh, I think Dr. Jockham, yeah, Dr. Jockham would like to oh, yes. provide some information before we uh, open up for Perfect. questions and discussion. Perfect. Great, thank you uh, again. Good evening, uh, board. Uh, as, a, as our student services um, department continues to grow and evolve and look at all of the different areas of needs um, that our students have, especially in this time of, of the COVID pandemic, and we know that uh, social emotional needs are huge. We know, and we also know that there um, are students who have drug and alcohol issues and uh, being away from school has not helped any of these issues as they're sitting home um, and not kind of accountable to come into campus um, on a daily basis. So one of the things that we're looking at is how to um, 
add more arrows into our quiver. Um, isn't that sound like a good Phil D'Agostino turn of phrase? Um, and um, uh, so what we, we know that um, this is a company that um, can provide us some of the support, some of the help we need. And what we're looking for right now is um, uh, your approval of a one-year contract for this company uh, that our student services team feels will be a good um, addition to our, our services. So Dr. D'Agostino is going to just go over a little bit of, because um, this is a, a little bit of a unique service that we haven't had prior in the district. So Dr. D'Agostino, can you share um, some more information, please? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Jockham. President Floor, Vice President Yelsey, members of the board, uh, executive cabinet, and uh, Zoom guests, thank you very much for having me here tonight. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and set that up. Um, as I'm, as I'm doing this, uh, I owe an apology to the superintendent. I, I was one of the people that, uh, slipped the score of the Dodger game. So my apologies, Mr. Lee Sung, uh, thought you would have wanted to know that. Uh, but I forgot about the TiVo piece. So yeah, you, you were one of about five people. So don't feel too <laughs> okay, bad. I don't feel that bad about it. I'm trying to share my screen here. Um, so just give me one second, please. Okay. Apologies, it's just with two screens, you have to. And you are aging yourself when you mentioned the word TiVo. I did, didn't I, <laughs> President Flora? I, I, yeah. That's sort of kind of scary. <laughs> my My apologies there too. So let me see if I can, do this now here to minimize a few windows. And there we go. Um, can you see my screen now? Proposal for implementation? Is that is that visible? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. fantastic. Thank you. So, okay, so once again, thank you for having me tonight. Uh, I think Dr. Jockham hit the nail on the head uh, in terms of this being another layer of support to the many things that we do. Um, as Ms. Anderson mentioned, we have a community alliance. As Mrs. Yelsey mentioned, we're very, very concerned about the mental health status and the safety and health issues that come from the pandemic related issues of being isolated. As Mrs. Uh, President Floor said, uh, we are concerned about staff and the hard work and the challenges that they're facing. And so, this uh, this pushes a lot of buttons, this proposal that, that we're about to uh, bring forth to you. And um, I just wanted to frame the, the issue by, by saying that there's, there's obviously been a variety of challenges to addressing mental health in, in our schools. And if we look at some of the more serious ones that have been a challenge for us as a district, um, social stigma, um, the lack of awareness that people have about mental health issues, especially if that lack of awareness uh, may be culturally driven, um, or it might be driven because of a lack of education, or it might be driven because of lack of knowledge. Um, th that's a concern for us. The access for families and staff is a big problem. And also gathering data, having our ability to gather data. And so, uh, as, as uh, was mentioned earlier, Care Solus, uh, was presented to us, and we did so quite quite a lot of research actually in contacting uh, surrounding districts uh, about the programming, uh, which other districts have been using. And um, what we find is is that Care Solus will be able to create an online portal for not just students but staff and families of students and staff. That can, that can connect them to providers for mental health and substance abuse needs. And there are three key features that the programming would address that we think are particularly uh, niche filling and uh, uh, very uh, forward thinking. The first is the care concierge service, which I'll talk about, along with the warm handoff and the meaningful data tracking. 
So the, the concierge care service is really just a fancy way of saying that people can have universal access to credible resources for students, family, and staff to address mental health, wellness, drug, alcohol issues. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It would be uh, tied to an online portal and appointments with providers and insurance issues and all of that would be addressed with this service. We're particularly um, interested in the fact that it has multilingual capabilities. Uh, and, and so that, that kind of availability really addresses the whole social stigma piece because it's a, it's a very, uh, I think, easily accessible way to get paired with mental health and wellness resources. And I know that some of our board members did take a look at that portal. There's also a warm handoff piece. Now, we're not just gonna simply refer people to the portal and say, go get your mental health and wellness uh, resources and, and needs taken care of through the portal. First of all, we wanna be absolutely clear that our social workers and our counselors and our psychologists and our behavior specialists are still gonna be doing frontline work and still gonna be doing case management with students and families. But when those needs go beyond the ability of the district or that particular specialist to do the kind of long-term ongoing case management or where the need is really uh, much more driven by a, a more nuanced specialist in the area of say drug addiction or significant mental health issues, that's where you wanna get insurance involved. That's where you wanna get medical providers involved. That's where you wanna get community resources involved. And that's where our staff can do this warm handoff by directly contacting Care Solus and then managing that transition from the care and service of the specialized professional at the school to the much more specialized uh, resources that come from say uh, drug and alcohol counseling opportunities or uh, psychiatrists or other mental health providers or even medical providers such as uh, doctors and, and other health providers in those areas. We would not be just kicking people over to those things. We would still be uh, focused on ma case management in terms of monitoring and progress. And Care Solus has confirmed with us that they would be providing us with updates on the handoff status. And then the third piece is the meaningful data tracking. Um, we don't know. I mean, we know that there's mental health issues and we've heard stories anecdotally from families. We've, we've, we've seen their faces of anguish, but we don't really know what we don't know in terms of how bad this really is. And I think what this will do for us is with the data tracking sheets that I have seen that Care Solus has sampled for us, we're gonna be able to look at trends. We're gonna be able to look at uh, where uh, there are concerns about certain kinds of mental health or wellness issues in our community geographically. We're gonna be able to get results back in terms of the frequency of use, the number of warm handouts, wh when and how our staff are interacting with the Care Solus resources. And I think all of these things, is just gonna give us a better picture of what we need to do to think long-term as a district about mental health and wellness. You know, we've talked a lot about screening, uh, doing screeners. This is really a, 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 a type of screening that we're gonna be able to do through the data to see where in fact the needs are and then be able to give you information, members of the board and Superintendent Lee Sung, give you the information to be able to then make decisions about resource deployment personnel deployment and and other important critical features to help our students and families in the areas of mental health and wellness. Um, so a couple of frequently asked questions because um, as we all know this has been something that is, has been talked about internally uh, and, and we're bringing it to you tonight but I wanted to make sure the public knew that Care Solus is, is not requiring its providers uh, to pay to be a part of the database. They don't pay a fee to Care Solus. The mission of Care Solus is supported by the school districts that partner with us, them actually, Care Solus, to serve families. Another frequently asked question is how does Care Solus identify service providers? And uh, I got this from Kristen Henry, so, our coordinator. So could you go back to the, that was really fast. I'm sorry, sure. I'm taking notes, thank you. Okay. 
Okay, thank and I'm, you. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to send this presentation to all of you, obviously, so. Yeah, that would be great because we haven't received it. So this is the first time we're seeing it. Thank you. If you could Got send it. it now, that would be really great. Thanks. Um, I, I don't know that I can send it now um, without oh. completely getting out of it uh, and, if, and. Yeah, uh, when, when you're done doing the presentation. Oh, perhaps, absolutely. But. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so how does CareSolus identify service providers? Um, again, I got this from Kristen Henry. Um, they look at state agency resources, county-based agencies, uh, various insurance plans, individual telehealth providers, federal agencies. And I think one of the things that has been um, a, a particular uh, bright point for CareSolus is they're, they're, they're really uh, uh, marshalling all of the different providers in our region that goes well beyond just Hogue, well beyond just um, uh, our community alliance, well beyond just our resources in Costa Mesa, and looks regionally and countywide uh, in this specific area of mental health and wellness providers. Um, how are services vetted? Uh, they are vetted through a variety of different criteria. The two major accrediting um, associations, kind of like the WASC for mental health and wellness, the Joint Commission on the Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, and the Commission on Accreditation of Rehabilitation Facilities, JCO and CARF, respectively, um, are, are the accrediting institutions for the service providers that CareSolus connects with. Um, they must have no history of probationary holds, lawsuits, or ripoff reports where they have been taking advantage of consumers. Uh, and so uh, the, these, are, these are the criteria that CareSolus is using to connect. Obviously, their reputation is on the line, so there is a vetting of the service providers they connect with. And, and, and certainly, the Newport Mesa Unified School District, again, is going to do its due diligence. We're going to monitor this very closely should you decide to approve uh, this one-year contract. And so who's using CareSolus? You know, we've always been a district that, that at times we, we are at the tip of the spear, and at other times we, um, we look at what our, our colleagues are doing. Uh, there's a variety of school districts that are using CareSolus. I uh, just this morning, I had a long talk with uh, the, my, my doppelganger over at the Huntington Beach Union High School District, Dan Bryan, um, who's a good friend of mine, uh, student services director. Um, he, he not only has a professional experience with CareSolus, but a personal one as well. And um, while I, uh, I'm not going to share the, the conversation we had, uh, he has not given me permission to do so, but he 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 was extremely grateful on a personal level for services that they provided, and I was very grateful for his honesty and his candor in in in. Uh, and I have a lot of respect for his professional judgment. Um, I do think that this is uh, this is something that we have never done before, uh, in the sense that we are partnering with a um, kind of like a clearinghouse for mental health and wellness resources. But I think it serves a niche. I think it serves the niche of being able to eliminate the social, social stigma. It allows people to access resources in a fairly anonymous and easy way. Um, it expands our ability as a district to have our service providers focus on the initial case management. And then if it gets more complicated, we're able to uh, pass that off. And then finally, there's data collection. And that data collection is something we've, we've um, uh, I'm sure a lot of districts are struggling with, but I think we can get a lot of data out of this that would be very useful for resource allocation and per, per, uh, personnel allocation. Uh, the cost is for one year, it's renewable and it's rescindable. Uh, we would start on November 1st or as soon as we can, practical, practicable to that date. And the cost is budgeted for 30,000 $300. Now, as you know, members of the board, I, I just want to uh, close with this. Um, we set our budgets. We set our budgets um, in April of, of the, uh, at the very latest in April before the new school year. And this was not budgeted. 
but after doing the research and after talking to Kristen Henry and talking to colleagues, we went back to our budget and student services and we made some decisions about what we could hold off on for one year in terms of professional development or training or what have you, um, supplies, and, and we cobbled together that 30,500 from existing budget lines. And the reason we did that is because we feel very strongly about the positive outcomes that can come from having this as a service to our students, families, and our staff members. So with that, I wanna thank you for the time you've given me to uh, give you this information. It is uh, the recommendation of student support services that, that you approve this agreement with CARESOLIS for the remainder of the 2021 school year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Phil. Okay, so um, I have uh, Trustee Barto. I'm off mute. I'm off. I'm off mute. Um, I have Trustee Barto. Her hand is up first. Thank you. Um, that thirty thousand is that prorated or is that an annual fee? So it, we elect it, to renew. Yeah, it's uh, it was about thirty five thousand when the school year started, Miss Barto. And so if we start on November first, we estimate it'll be about thirty thousand three hundred. And then um, my other question is, how does this pair with Mr. Elmers? We haven't, um, we haven't gone down that road uh, to talk with Mr. Knights about that. Although um, we obviously are always looking at programming that is going to feed into Mr. Elmer to create that rich data picture that we have by looking at different platforms of, of software that, that have student information. Um, again, much of the much of the information in terms of specific student outcomes is HIPAA protected. So uh, some of that will be excluded from, say, a teacher's ability to see a student's profile if they should access CareSolus resources. Um, and the data that we will be getting um, will be aggregated in some areas and disaggregated in in others. And so. Um, I don't know the extent to which we will connect with Mr. Elmer, but we will certainly be speaking with Mr. Knights about the extent to which that is possible. And then my last question is, um, because I'm in software for $30,000 seems pretty low for software at the amount of support that it sounds like they're providing. So are we actually providing, are they providing the data and then we're interpreting that our support? Like how, how hands-on are they? Because, um, yeah, the data is um, the data is largely frequency data. Um, I'll tell you, it's frequency data. There is our ability to uh, to disaggregate the data by zip codes, also. Uh, but it's not. I mean, yeah, we're not going to get um, you know extrapolations that are really deep. We would probably have to do um, you know some of the more grunt work in terms of drilling down once we get the data. Okay. Uh, Is that it? Uh, Trustee Anderson? Thank you for um, the time that you've, you've taken and put this together. Um, Dr. Agostino, and thank you for the time that you have spent with me explaining it. Um, I think for me, you know that mental health is something that is really important to me. I think it's a crucial need for our students. Um, I do like that this um, offers support not just for um, students, but also for staff and even for parents. Um, I think that that is a wonderful resource. And I, um, as uh, Board President Floor said earlier, I think everyone is in need of some of those right now. Um, one of the things for me that I have some concerns with um, are, and that's why I was like <laughs> trying to take notes. So on the, on the slide about the warm handoff, can you define what you, your understanding, I'm, I, from even yeah. the conversations we've had and from that slide, the warm handoff can mean a variety of things and that is not covered in there. So what do you understand that yeah. to be for them. Let, let me tell you what a warm handoff means to me and what I will expect it to be as the director of student services um, who oversees uh, the mental health and wellness operations of the district. It means to me that when one of our specialized personnel 
counselors, psychologists, social workers, behavior specialists, even social work interns, um, uh, our, 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 our colleagues in special education. Whenever there is a student um, or a family dynamic where the issues are extremely complicated and we need additional support, um, we can use Care Solus to hand off that case management and hand off that more complicated case to even more specialized providers for long-term solutions and long-term care. Care that school districts were never intended to provide, care that has become the de facto responsibility of districts because of our in loco parentis uh, duties, but care that can be better served by specialists like say psychiatrists or medical doctors or other specialized person. So we hand that case off. It doesn't mean we are giving up on the case. It doesn't mean that we are abandoning the case. It doesn't mean that we are letting go of the case. My expectation as the director of student services as charged to me by my boss, the assistant superintendent is to make sure we follow through and make sure those students stay supported wherever they are. Not unlike what we do with our community alliance partners, not unlike what we do when we send kids to Hogus Fire, not unlike what we do when we know that kids are at College Hospital and at other places. So that's, for me, that's what the warm handoff is. And if it's not something like that, as it is presented to me, then we're not gonna renew this contract next year. Okay, yeah, I, I mean, I think the, positive for me is also that it's only a one-year contract. I think I there are still a great deal of questions that I have about this, particularly because I think, you know, we have 211 OC that is very similar. Um, and I think a lot of people who um, have any kind of mental health need, there are a lot of other factors that come into play. And so there's also OC links and they're very similar. And so my understanding of doing a lot of research around this is it sounds a bit like it's a middleman. Um, and so I'm not necessarily sure that it is the best choice, but um, I'm willing to support you in it for a one year term um, and hope that we get some good data. Um, I do want to have regular reports back though, because I think it's really important, particularly as we're making decisions about how best to care for our school communities. Um, and I do want to overall ask again, um, like the board and administration that we have a comprehensive study session on mental health. I think that particularly going to the holidays, it's really important. And as we hopefully have um, another chance to have MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support that are integrated, comprehensive, collaborative, um, rather than just, oh, here's a one-time kind of an app that we're promoting, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to us doing that and having a really um, holistic approach. So, um, so yeah, so I thank you for answering all of those questions, and um, I, I hope that this serves us well for one year. Thank you. Trustee Matoye. I'm sorry, I can't hear Ms. Matoye. <coughs> because I was muted. Okay, let's try this again. I move that we approve the agreement with Addiction Treatment Technologies, LLC, doing business as Care Solace for the 21, 20, 2021 school year. Second. Well, that's thank you. So I will have I, I will say a couple of comments and then um, um, uh, thank you, Phil and uh, Dr. Jockham and Kristen Henry for bringing this. Um, as most of you know, this is a, an area that is near and dear to my hearts. Um, I too have some concerns um, regarding this organization, uh, mainly because I don't find them um, having a lot of expertise in this area. Uh, one is a former superintendent, one is a, a developer of technology, and they're basically hedge fund individuals. But because it's a one-year 
uh, one year contract, um, I think that uh, it's well worth it when you consider a couple of items. One is, um, Phil, you talk about the warm handoff that our individuals and our professionals will be doing. My big concern is the warm handoff that they claim they're going to do for themselves. When there's a referral, we don't know who that referral is. Um, it's a self-referral pro process. And that's where I want to know. Um, they, cl they claim it uh, as a warm handoff. When somebody picks up and puts in a referral and says, I have a drug problem or I have su suicidal, one of those two items, and then they identify. Their warm handoff is that they actually connect to a, with their algorithm, they have a referral system to some, some provider. Now that provider, they, provide, they give the name of that provider, but it will really be incumbent upon the individual to seek out the help. If that help is, if that connection is made and that person makes the appointment, that's what they consider a warm handoff. Uh, my concern is making sure that we are provided the necessary documentation about those self-referrals so that we can follow up in the long term. Because if we don't know who they are, how can we expect to support them um, as they re-enter and integrate into our school system? Same thing with adults. Adults are a different issue. But again, that's, that's my big concern is, is how they are going to keep us apprised of those individuals and those students who have individually and the families have sought help and then they've handed off and we don't know who those providers are. We don't know whether they're having meetings. We don't know anything about them. And that's, that's where my concern is. But as you and Dr. Jockham said, it's another quiver into it. I also agree with, with Trustee Anderson that we need to really address this issue and have a plan on how we're going to address um, the full capacity. We have great therapists, we have great MSWs. We don't have a professional in the area of, of um, drug and alcohol, which is the number one killer of youth in this society today. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. We have an epidemic. And I believe that we are not, we, we are not touching that. And we have had a number of deaths of students in this district or former students in this district who have either committed suicide or have died because of drugs and alcohol. Pure and simple. Let's not cut to anything else, it's that. And until we address those issues head on and deal with them and provide the support. And One Recovery does an outstanding job. I have nothing but accolades for One Recovery, but it's not in every one of our school districts and it is not necessarily a certified care provider that some of these kids absolutely need. So I will support this, but I do have some concerns and I'm glad it's a one year. Uh, with that, uh, there is a motion made by Trustee Matoye and seconded by Trustee Yelsey. Roll call, please. Student Board Member Bailey Bogart. She yes. May have, oh, yes. She's there. Trustee Floyd. Yes. Trustee Yelsey. Yes. Trustee Black. Yes. Trustee Bartow. Yes. Trustee Anderson. With hesitation, yes. Trustee Snell. Yes. Okay. Trustee motion. Trustee Yes. Uh, trustee, uh, the motion carries seven uh, zero. Ladies and gentlemen, we're at 1020. At 1030, we must vote on whether to extend this meeting by 15 minutes. That's all we can go. That's, that's, that's the regulation in our policy. Is a, it's a 15 minute extension. Um, I, th I thought it was two, but we just pulled it up, right? And it's, it's 15, correct? Did it say? She'll check it. I just want to make sure that we are understanding that we may have to uh, go through and we can check and see because I know that we're, we're meeting on Thursday. Yeah. So what I would prefer, if you don't mind, is the items that have no comments on them 
that we that we push the, that we have several items that have comments on them and that's uh, that's the question is whether we go to the consent calendar yeah president floor i i, I want to urge um you and the board uh, if we could push through and get through these approvals we do have a hearing uh item that um, yes exactly that, that is timely that we do need to get that right. approved as well but if we can just move swiftly uh that would be my recommendation okay perfect that's what we're gonna do okay so item um 17 uh 16 e is approved management confidential supervisor compensation and benefits for 2021 uh so um that's uh mrs Ms. Olson. Yes. yes and i and i will be quick to move things along um, before you have uh, before you tonight you have the recommendation to approve for management confidentials and supervisors the compensation for 2020-21 as you know our uh, nmft and csea have previously concluded their negotiations i did meet and confer with um, both nmaa and supervisors and so the recommendation is that the employee monthly contribution to health and welfare benefits remains at the same rate as 1920 as our other units, a one-time off-schedule payment. And then for our supervisors who actually do not receive a communication stipend, that they would receive a $500 stipend to support that increase of use of personal technology equipment and materials that we are using this year in particular. Our NMAA um, folks, they do receive a communication stipend, so that is not included for them, but it is for the supervisors. Okay. Okay. So, um, so there's no discussion. Oh, Trustee Matoye. Oh, I have another question here. Let me see. Make sure. Make sure. Hold on. Did anybody? No. Okay. Go ahead. It must be a time thing. I move that we approve the management confidential and supervisor compensation and benefits for 2020. 2021. Okay. Okay. It's been moved by Trustee Matoye and seconded by Trustee Black. Um, roll call, please. Trustee Floor. Yes. Trustee Yelsey. Yes. yes. Trustee Black. Yes. yes. Trustee Bartow. Yes. Trustee Anderson. Yes. Trustee Snell. Yes. Trustee Matoye. Yes. Um, motion carries. Okay. Um, because we have uh, the public hearings are time sensitive, I am going to power through those first. That's items 18, uh, 18A and the resolution consent calendar because those are time sensitive. They, they involve um, applications. And so uh, trust uh, item 18A public hearing compliance with requirements of education code section 60119 and 60422B, sufficiency of textbooks and instructional materials that are consistent with the content and cycles of the curriculum framework for 2021. This is the William Settlement legislation. Mr. Drake. Thank you, uh, President Fleur. I'd like to ask um, Ms. Gailey uh, to uh, open her mic and frame this for us. President Floor, I want to remind you that we have a comment. From yes, that's what I was writing in the chat. Yes, yes. Do you, do you want to take the comment first or do you yes. want me to yes. open it? Yes. yes, please. Is that a yes for me to read it? Yes. Okay. Um, this is from Tamara Fairbanks from NMFT. I do believe that Newport Mesa is, is compliant with the guidelines of the Williams Settlement. However, I know that we can do more than the baseline of what is legal. We do have a current curriculum in math and language arts and teachers are finally receiving the materials 
they need for in-person instruction to carry out those standards and goals for learning. However, I do wish that the Williams settlement held districts accountable for all, for all curriculum because that is where we see the glaring issues. Elementary music has current supplemental materials that align with current standards, but it has been 20 years since they have actually had a text. Elementary PE needs materials that allow them to run and jump indoors without injury. English, <laughs> world language, and many subjects in high schools have operated for years without a curriculum, and we still have yet to see document cameras and uh, technology in classrooms in various schools. I, for one, would like to see a day when we, we are more than compliant and achieving the baseline. I look forward to a day when we maximize the resources in every area of our district. Don't we all? Okay. Uh, Ms. Gailey. Uh, yes. So um, this is an annual item that we present to the board where we attest to the sufficiency of materials as required by Ed Code uh, in our core areas as well as in our foreign languages and in our um, health and uh, lab sciences and secondaries. So um, we are here to attest that we have sufficiency, which means enough material to support all of our students. And I have to say that um, and despite the challenges that we've had with remote learning, we're very, very proud of distributing multitudes of uh, resources to our students over the course of um, prior uh, spring as well as summer to ensure that all of our students have access to English language arts, math, history, and science, and um, that we've provided the, the sufficiency that we're attesting to this evening. Concerns? May I have a motion, please? Oh, yes. I guess I have to close it. Close the public hearing. Okay, moving on. We heard the comment, so we're moving. We don't have to, do we have to, we don't have to vote on this, right? You're bringing this back? It's on the resolution, got it. There it is, okay. Item number nine, uh, 19, which is the resolution consent calendar. All items listed under the con uh, resolution consent are adopted in one motion. Uh, item 19A, adopt resolution 131020 in compliance with re requirements of education code section 60119 and 60422 b sufficiency of material uh, textbooks and materials, Williams settlement legislation. And uh, 19B, adopt resolution 12, 10, 20. Separate. 12. It's in four. I, it, I think I they should moved. be separately. What? I think they should be voted on separately. They're too different. It won't take us any time. I just think they should be voted on separately. Well, there it's under the resolution consent calendar and they're voted on uh, separate, uh, as, as one. But that's okay. Doesn't fine. it say unless. All right, voted. fine, fine. Is there a motion? I, I move to adopt resolution 13 10 10 20. Second. It's been moved by Trustee Black and seconded by Trustee Matoye to adopt resolution 13 10 20 in compliance with requirements of education code that I just read. You just read. <laughs> uh, roll call, please. Trustee Fleur. Yes. Trustee Yelsey. Yes. Trustee Black. Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Snell? Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. Okay, item Present nine. Four, I would like to move to adopt a resolution 12-10-20 to apply for a grant from the South Coast Air Quality Management District. Would you like uh, Mr. Holcomb to explain this, please? Well, I want a motion just in case he... <laughs> I'll second your motion. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Mr. Holcomb. Thank you, President Fleur. Um, this, this is a grant that the uh, Air Quality Management District has uh, run in the past. The district has also participated in this grant program in the past. And we would encourage you to participate again as this is an opportunity for us to replace some of our oldest, most polluting buses with uh, newer buses. All right. Terrific. 
So um, it's been moved by Trustee Black and seconded by Trustee Matoye to adopt resolution 12 10 20 to apply for a grant from the South Coast Air Quality Management District. Roll call, please. Trustee Floor? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Trustee Black? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Do you get that? Yeah. Thank you. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Snell? Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. Okay. Um, we are now at 1030. As per the board policy, we are required to, to move um, and mo make a motion. There, it's silent on the number of, of minutes, apparently. So we can go. I have, we have uh, a minimum of uh, 24 um, minutes of public comment on this item on three items on the consent calendar. We have 17A, which is 10 comments, uh, 17A8, one comment, 17C1, one comment, and 17C2-4, uh, one comment. For a total of 23 times two is 46, correct? And that's at two minutes apiece. Yeah. I, I believe some of the items or the comments are sh pretty short, so it may not take a full two minutes. Okay. So, so do we have a motion to move and to go to 11 o'clock? So All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're, that's Aye. not going to be a roll. It's not a roll call because it's not on the. Okay, so we will move to item uh, 17 A. Two, which is ratify agreement with MTGL for Geofer Foundation Design Theater Project at Estancia High School. Uh, do you want to read this? I just want to make a comment on this. This is a ratification. Perhaps, Mr. Uh, Holcomb, you can indicate what a ratification is before we get into it. So we'll take the comments that next. Can you define what a ratification is? Yes, yes, Mrs. Uh, Fleur. The, the reason that this item is being brought to you for ratification is because it was necessary to, uh, for me to sign the contract so that the work could proceed to keep us uh, on schedule for our uh, submittal of the project to DSA for its approval. Perfect, great, thank you. So, uh, Trustee Bartow, you have the first comment on 16, 17A2. My comment is from Leah Ursulu. Trustees, please do not invest any further funds into exploration of this theater site at Estancia until there is sufficient community input and the site is 100% final. This is quite reckless to spend over $32 million in basically the dark with no community input short of your community of NMUSD staff and two residents. Folks don't even know about this project in the community and you're making the decision to get rid of mature old growth trees without even a peep of public engagement. When cities spend this much on infrastructure impacting natural landscapes, there are countless community input forums, review by Parks Commission, Planning Commission, or others. When a school district does it, there is nothing. This is irresponsible and I urge you to slow down and reconsider. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Black, you're the next one. Oh um, yes, community member Joanne Nichols. Dear board, why are we bothering with cutting down the Estancia trees and theater right now? Please devote your time and focus on getting secondary back on campus and expanding primary to more than um, two hours and 45 minutes. This is not a district that can execute on many high impact projects as seen by the Ensign Trees construction. This is, that is still ongoing just focus on getting the kids back. The kids aren't even on campus right now to care about the tree, the trees or the theater. What is the business rationale for this? Just keep focus on the only thing most people care about right now, getting the kids back on campus. Thank you for your time. Joanne Nichols. Terrific. I have Marty O'Mara. Uh, please delay decision on Estancia Theater until new trustees are seated, then engage the community and publicize the oversight committee meetings. Sarah Mooney says, please delay decisions on the Estancia Theater and removal of trees until the election and until any new trustees take their places on the board. 
Please also delay until 2021 after there has been input from present and past students who attended Estancia and until there have been meetings of the oversight committee. Thank you. The comment is from Kara Whiteman. Please do not make a decision on the Estancia theater. Allow newly elected board members to weigh in. After the insecurity debacle, which is truly embarrassing, new board members and Estancia families should have a say. My comment is from Wendy Lease. I ask you to continue this item to a 2021 agenda. Community outreach to get input on the theater and its placement has been minimal. Now, now is not the time to move forward with the Barbo Van Holt Theater Project. Recent social media posts by many soundly oppose removing the trees. Please listen to the community which you serve. COVID has changed everything. Continue this item until the, until the new board is seated. Let them reach out to the community which include Estancia students and grads and get their input first. I don't know whose idea it is in the first place to remove the trees, but it's a bad idea. Maybe the person doesn't live here and understand the Costa Mesa, that Costa Masons like to be included in important decisions like removal of beautiful trees and the placement of the theater. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Bartow. Mine is from Laurie Smith. Dear trustees and Newport Mesa citizens, I am writing to request the board vote against approval of IT, item 17A2 geotech contract for the Estancia Theater and to put a hold, a pause on spending further monies or signing additional contracts. I became concerned about the location of the theater and the removal of the sycamores and grassy yard after walking in Fairview Park this spring during the shutdown. Estancia's trees and the open natural landscape surrounding the campus are important spaces in our community. I learned the trees are especially important to the students and alums as well as the neighbors. After gathering more facts on the project, I have come away with more questions than answers and a deeper concern. Where is the voice of the community? There has not been a community meeting as is standard with public facility project of this magnitude. Citizen Oversight Committee meeting minutes show staffers told members that there would be a lot of community engagement per the board's guidelines. This has not happened. Costs are another concern, estimated at 32 million with already several overages and it's only in the design phase. And tonight you are being asked to approve another cost overage of $30,000 without you or the public having the committee's meeting minutes from the past two meetings since May or any regular updates. Then there is the timing. It makes no sense to push a project of such magnitude forward when you, the staffers and the community are distracted by the pandemic and reopening and the election of three trustees in just eight days. They should have a say. Their voters should have a say. And getting back to the trees, how was that location chosen? I see no information on this. The community has a right to be part of such a huge decision that will last well into the future. The recent destruction of ensign trees and the negative lasting impact on my former neighbors is still fresh. And then there are past facilities debacles that have scarred the Estancia community. The empty pool, the poles, and Joanne Street neighbors, and years of unresolved toxic vapors. I am grateful for the committee and staffers' hard work in this initial design phase of the Estancia Theater and your careful consideration of putting this vote and any future decisions on hold until January. Thank you. Trustee Black. Our community member is um, Laura Yor. Has enough consideration been given to the placement of the new performing arts theater? Green space, aside from sports fields, are needed <clears throat> for the students to congregate on. Mature trees are a must in such a location. Thank you. Uh, I have Leslie Murtaugh. Um, I am thrilled that the Estancia Zone will finally get the state of the art performing art center. Our community and children and communities deserve the best. I do have concerns about this, the building location. The senior lawn is the only outdoor park in the area on campus. It's very small and is enjoyed by students past and present. The shade of the trees combined with the cool ocean breeze create a perfect re social respite for young scholars. This area is far removed from the drama and music departments and lacks ample parking. The south parking lot has lots of room, is a setback from the street and is currently the most underused lot on campus. This location is closest to the music and drama departments. It would be at least less disruptive for the students travel back and forth from class to the theater. This is important for everyone teaching and learning on campus. Both my daughter and I attended Adams, Link, T. Winkle, and Estancia. Additionally served as, I additionally served as a teacher for NMUSD for 34 years. I know what works 
for both educators and students. Please give time for community input and increase transparency before pro pro proceeding with this project. Thank you for your time. This comment is from Bradford C. Smith. This agenda item could authorize roughly $30,000 in additional soils engineering fees. The tip of the iceberg of a $32 million plus for a building that we will be saddled with for the next 80 years. But what do we know about the edifice? Is it LEED certified? Does it generate its own power and store it? How is it compatible with a 60 year old school visibly on the decline? As an architect and planner, I must ask how the adjacency of the theater to the Placentia Avenue a very busy street was justified. <clears throat> and with that in mind, were other locations analyzed as options in a fair and open manner? One must question the notion of throwing tens of millions at a structure that is not uplifting or transforming the campus as a whole, but instead leaves the campus bereft of needed improvements, the majority of the students and faculty, the stakeholders getting nothing of value from it. I have to ask you, the members of the board, to question how costs are justified. Where are the voices of the campus and community and what other options have you explored? Until then, I suggest you vote to slow down on the decisions that allow this project to go any further. <clears throat> and then we move on to 17A8, correct? We're just reading the comments for the consent calendar? Uh, yeah, let's just keep going. Let's just keep going. And then we can, then we'll, we'll address, we'll have a, a Mr. Welcome, if needed, because there may be some questions. I see uh, Trustee Snell's hand up already. I'm sorry, I gotta mute myself. Are you moving on to comments on a different line, a different line item? Well, there's we have we have we have consent count. This is all on consent. It hasn't been moved up. So there's. I know, but okay. I, but if if those are all the comments on that particular that's line correct. item, okay, I would like to respond to that. Um, uh, that sounds good. That's fine with okay. that. Okay, only be only because um, the comments that I've heard. Um, don't uh, I don't think the people that made the comments that I heard understand the history of this project. Um, it, the fact that this project was part of Measure F and um, should have been built years ago, but the Oversight Committee for Measure F decided that to um, combine the theater and the um, middle school project at Costa Mesa High School. So. Um, so Estancia High School is, is wound up being the only school without a theater. Um, there was a million dollars uh, put aside from the balance of that money to start the planning. Um, when we were able to refinance the bond debt, we were able to pull out money to do this project. Um, and it was addressed, it was approved. There was a committee that um, chose a site based on what the best um, location was for the theater that didn't impede neighbors, that it didn't, um, uh, that, that worked for the redesign of the school. We have waited years for this theater and to delay this, even though I know what's on this uh, on our consent calendar has nothing to do with um, it's 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 strictly about a soil sample that's already taken place. But I feel I have to say that if we were to delay this longer, it would cost more money. Uh, right now, it's not due to be complete till 2023. It would be delayed another year. And this is extremely, extremely unfair to the Estancia zone, not just Estancia High School, but it's all, this, all the schools that feed into Estancia High School that could benefit from that theater. And um, I just, I feel that the people, I know most of the people that wrote the comments and they don't even go to that school. And, um, I would encourage them to look back at the meetings that took place in, two, in October of 2019 and um, September of 2019. This project was vetted. This project um, is in design right now. 
and um, this project needs to go forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holcomb, um, could you um, address some of the concerns that were, were presented? Well, actually, I, I think that Mrs. Snell's comments about uh, the presentations that were made here to the board uh, last year uh, were in line with the board's policies. The board specifically asked for this project that we uh, set up a committee that included both the music teacher and the uh, theater teacher from Estancia High School along with the principal, the assistant principal, and two additional community members, one of whom is the primary supporter of the theater program uh, at Estancia High School. All of those folks uh, met regularly with the design team. Uh, it was a very robust uh, and uh, actually an excellent process. They actually, as went through, looked at two additional sites. You may recall as Ms. Snell alluded to in September of last year, uh, you approved an amendment to the architect's contract to, uh, to pay for their review of two additional sites. Basically, uh, five sites were considered on the campus. Pretty much everywhere where this would fit was considered, and that committee recommended to you all uh, for the location that you ultimately approved uh, and you'll see the schematic design and the entire presentation as part of that October meeting that Mrs. Snell uh, referenced. Uh, thank you. I also want to echo uh, what Trustee um, Snell said. I spent uh, the better half of yesterday and today watching every single board meeting, even back to January of 2018 when this was first brought up. I listened to four hours and 32 minutes on October 7th. Uh, which was presented as a schematic. Do we have a design? We have a schematic that is not the same as an architectural design, correct? So we are submitting to DSA the, so, a design. Very, uh, in, in very layman's brief terms, uh, the schematic design uh, outlines all of the programmatic requirements. So actually the first part that, that committee did was they went through the program for the project to determine how many seats would the theater be, uh, what types of spaces were necessary, green rooms, changing rooms, all of those types of spaces, how many square feet would it take. All of that was reviewed and vetted initially. Uh, then con concepts for how that amount of uh, square footage could fit together on the campus and in what locations was considered. Uh, after that was considered in the multiple locations, the committee came to a recommendation uh, for a particular location and looked at how it would look and what the design would be. That was the schematic design. And uh, for those who would go back and look at last October's presentation, you'll see that it shows the, the seating arrangements, it shows the locations of the rooms, it really shows pretty much everything. It shows the exterior rendering of what uh, it will look like uh, in that location. And there was a discussion of the trees uh, in, in that particular uh, discussion. And, and you all approved that. What that then means for, the, for those of us who uh, proceed with uh, projects is from then on, all that's left is really what you might call engineering. Uh, that's a bit of an, uh, an affront to the architects because uh, in, in layman's terms, engineering is, is, the, um, is the details of how it all goes together. Uh, there are architectural things, but mostly uh, the uh, complete design development, which figures out how is it structurally going to be supported, uh, the mechanical system, how will it serve the building, all of that is done in design development. And then we move into the most uh, elaborate portion, which is uh, construction documents. And that's the portion that the project is currently uh, coming to the completion of so that it can be submitted to the Division of the State Architect for their code review and approval. So then it can be bid and uh, hopefully 
uh, come in within budget and be uh, started and completed according to the schedule. Great, thank you. And just to, and just to be also be clear, the COC has nothing to do. The COC's project, the, the Citizens Oversight Committee, looks at equity. That's their primary focus, is to look at equity on what is spent in Measure F. That, and it was established per uh, Senator Morlock at the time, he was, and we did it on Measure A. It was established, it's made up of a whole host of people that have to be specially vetted. They have to have certain, you know, they have to be part of a taxpayer association, senior citizens. But all they look at, they don't look at the, they look at equity. Is this equitable? Is the expenditure, is, do they deserve the equitable? And that's exactly what they did. They looked at it and agreed that this was an equitable uh, expenditure of funds on Measure F. But I, I would like to add on to that is, um, it, it wasn't equitable for Costa Mesa High School to get both the um, middle school enclave and the theater at the same time. And the, Corona Del Mar did the same thing. Yeah, right? and it, but they did it because it was a cost savings and we understood exactly. that. But we have waited long enough and this whole board has voted for this to go forward. You cannot go back and change everything every time new members come onto the board. Everyone in this room voted 7-0 to proceed with this theater in that location. And that was my comment. Thank you. That was going to be my comment, Mrs. Floor, was that this board voted 7-0 to approve that design in that location. Exactly, and our kids have waited long enough. Okay, um, I have Miss Matoyo. Is that what you had to say, uh, Trustee Barto? You you're up. Yes, I remember that vote, and I remember why we picked the, the why we were recommended to pick that site was because of the footprint and the amount of room that we wanted to add that was bigger than parking lot in the south. Um, but and I think that I mean it's already happened with soil samples; it's done. But I think that what I'm really hearing more desire for is community meetings and community input and follow up and steps along the project. And I think that that's the biggest problem that we have in our facilities projects is not that the end result isn't a good result. The pool is gorgeous at Estancia. And I have people telling me that all the time, but the community follow through is not really there. So I think if there's anything that we can take away from this is that we need to start, let's get out, we've got three, two, three years till it's done, let's get those community meetings going so people understand why we picked the site, why it had to be where it is, the whole equity piece you're talking about, Vicki, all these different things need to kind of be, what is this saying like in marketing, you communicate seven times or eight times or whatever it is, we need to communicate that because I think uh, part of what happened with Ensign is people forgot why it was important along the way. I guess the question is, uh, Mr. Uh, Holcomb, did we follow the same process at Costa Mesa High School? Because I remember how that went. We did. We had very few community participation yeah. there. Obviously, uh, you're aware, Ms. Fleur, that I wasn't here at the time that you all did Costa Mesa High School. But I do know over the last uh, three and a half, nearly four years that I have been here at the district, that, um, that the board, uh, with, with the prior members and, and with this members, these members have asked us to continue to uh, add more opportunities for input into its facilities projects. So this project now has the most input uh, of any project that you've done uh, as your most recent uh, significant project. Thank you. Uh, Trustee, yes, we're running out of time. Yes. That's what I was gonna say. Can we just continue? So sure. Okay. another meeting. So 17A, uh, uh, we're at 17A8, we have one comment, uh, which is a business services agreement with CEM Labs for sports field at Corona Del Mar, uh, Trustee Yelsey. Uh, this comment is from Brian Olson. Whoever is responsible for the Corona Del Mar track and field project should be fired. This project was to originally be completed by June, 2020. Even with the mandatory lockdown due to COVID, this project should have been a had a new completion date of August 2020. The project isn't even close to completion. The extremely excessive change orders for soil testing seems someone did not properly bid out the project. 
The new NMUSD superintendent is solely responsible to oversee all construction to, for all facilities and he should be fired. What a mistake it was for the NMUSD board to promote him. The board should have re reached out to find a more qualified prospect instead of decreasing the required qualifications in order to hire Lee Sung. NMUSD Board of Education is made up of very lazy people that do not prepare for board meetings, nor do they know how to run a civilized meeting. Wow. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, 17C, uh, any further, any comments on that one? Uh, Mr. Holcomb, do you have anything about the sports field? No, okay. Uh, 17C1, uh, I see your hand, Mrs. Anderson. Uh, uh, 17 C1 human resources approve MOU between NMUSD and MFT read first trimester elementary report card release day and parent conference trustee Anderson I'll save my comment for later it's no you have a read oh <laughs> that's what I, was gonna... <laughs> I thought we just did that one um, okay mine is from Tamara Fairbanks and MFT president I stand in support of the MOU agreement by the Federation and Newport Mesa Unified. I believe our teams did an excellent job working on an agreement that will help our elementary employees with the upcoming parent conferences and report cards. Thank you. Uh, item 17, C2-C4, Human Resources Approved Certificated employment uh, uh, assignment alternative options ed code 4425-6b 4425-58-7b uh, and 44263. Uh, Trustee Barto. My comment is from Tam Tamara Fairbanks NMFT president. This is a stark change in format for these items. Please explain why the format of these reports have been changed. Uh, trustee, uh, um, sorry, trustee. Uh, Ms. Olson, do you have an answer to that one? Yes, I do. Actually, this um, in November 2018 is when we started to do this item, which is an annual, um, actually it's biannual um, item that comes forward. And the reason behind that was for efficiency sake. We submit the board item on a Monday and then by Friday we add in the register to go with it because we're still gathering information usually throughout the week. So this is a practice that has been in place since November 2018. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we've dispensed with all the readings. Move, uh, adoption. Move adoption of the consent calendar. Consent calendar. Uh, okay. Did you take your hand off, Trustee Anderson? Okay. Okay, so uh, it's been moved by Trustee Matoye, seconded by Trustee Black. Uh, motion. A roll call, please. Trustee Floor? Yes. Trustee Yelsey? Yes. Trustee Black? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Snell? Yes. Trustee Matoye? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, passes 7-0. We are now at 10.59. We are going to thank you all the board, but uh, Please uh, submit your, you know, all of you that are here in the room that are assistant soups and things like that. Maybe you can submit a report. Can you submit it on the Friday with just submit a report so that we have some updates on that so that we can finish? Yeah, um, absolutely. That'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> I'd appreciate that. Um, and, if, and if we have uh, committee reports also, please. Okay. Uh, great, and we'll see you all on um, Thursday. Well, we don't have any confirmation about Thursday. My understanding is everyone can do it except uh, Trustee Black. Is that correct? 12 to 2 on Thursday? What time? We didn't get a time. 12 to 2. I think that's trust. Uh, didn't get it. We didn't get anything. Right. Uh, so we were, we were just confirming everyone's count. <laughs> Looks like uh, Thursday from 12 to 2 uh, works for everybody except for Trustee Black. So uh, we will send out an invitation and confirm that with all of you. <laughs> is that going to be in person or is that going to be? Uh, yes, in person. Okay. All right. Can I make my comment? I just wanted to make a sure. comment about the ratifying. Um, if it's at all possible, can we please get the contracts beforehand for things like this rather than ratifying them after the fact? 
I would like to know what is going on before we're ratifying them. Thank you for all, all construction projects. Thank you. Um, Trustee um, Anderson, just for clarification, is during the summer when we're not meeting, that's when we uh, give authorization because the board traditionally, this is unusual, but traditionally the board doesn't meet in July and August, and that's when we, uh, and I think we take actually take a vote on it in, October, in, in June, there where we, we assign and allow them to conduct the business of the board over the summer so that we're not having to have meetings and motions. So I think that's relevant in this specific case and several other cases. So that may be fine for the summer, but overall, I'm, the whole point we're here is to get contracts. So I would appreciate if we get them, we're not ratifying them after the fact. Thank you. Not a problem. Okay, meetings adjourned. Thank you.